Hello everyone. Hopefully you don't have to wait too long. Sorry about the delay. Um, as you can see, I've got a fairly complicated um, live stream set up here. So that's what I've got going for me right now. Um, hopefully you're all having a great Wednesday. This is a bit different. Normally I do game uh, streaming on Wednesday, but here I'm doing my podcast. Um, this has been a long time coming. Basically, uh, back in December, I was about to hit 100,000. Let me know if the uh, audio is good, by the way. I was about to hit 100,000 subscribers, and um, I did a poll on YouTube. Got a good amount of um, responses, and anything from uh, Daggerfall ASMR to uh, my favorite games of all time was on it. And uh, yeah, so this this ended up becoming uh, the preferred option. And as uh, Cyberpunk Part 2 kept on getting delayed and pushed back and pushed back and pushed back, I decided that instead of taking a whole bunch of time off of Cyberpunk Part 2 and Part 3, I would do uh, the 100k subs uh, live. So I'm going to try to do that now. So I've done some preparation. I've got some titles lined up. Um, and But all otherwise, this is completely unscripted. Just my, uh, just my thoughts as they come to my head. So <laughs> thought thought I was a gap gun. You know, the gap gun is the best way to do a silent takedown. Um, yeah, awesome. Yeah, I know I, I kind of put this together. It's kind of a last minute idea, but I've been thinking about it for a while. So um, sorry about the delay. I just was kind of preparing some some stuff. I'm just doing this solo because I figured it'd be kind of uh, arrogant to keep somebody on on the uh, podcast with me while talking about my favorite games. I, I don't really think that was a great idea. So, um, yeah. Anyway, I've got some got some things going on. I, I amped up the volume because I know the volume was a bit quiet last time. So hopefully everything is good. So, um, so I kind of I wrote a bunch of ideas down. I kept on adding to it. Kept on adding to it, and then I just kind of, um shuffled the list a bit um kind of like i would do a deck of cards so uh in no particular order um these are i didn't stick to like top 10 or anything like that i figured that'd be too restrictive so i just kind of put it put together the the games that uh came to me as um they came to me i might have forgotten a couple but these are definitely the ones that stuck out to my mind the last couple days at least all righty so hopefully this works uh, in part number, part number one, already screwed up. Awesome. Part number one, uh, we've got Demon Souls. Uh, Demon Souls is the first of the Soulsborne games I ever played. Um, it was basically recommended by a couple of journalists and uh, game uh, outlets as sort of like a nes hard type game um you know just like a just like a sort of uh return to form where games were actually challenging you and punishing you to get better and better at the game like whereas a lot of modern rpgs and even action rpgs would be fairly casual as we saw in like you know the return of diablo and diablo 3 the beginning uh difficulty of diablo 3 almost felt like a tutorial difficulty it was really really just kind of a pushover difficulty they made it harder in later patches and stuff, but, um, you know, it's, it, this game really promised to kind of, you know, deliver on the difficulty. And I remember, uh, being terrified at the very beginning because these, the first few enemies here were just, uh, absolute, uh, you know, if you, if you missed or you like, uh, what I first thing I did is I charged them and I wore myself out. And so they just like hit me three times and I was almost already dead. Like I almost got completely killed by one of the first enemies in the game and i'm like okay i i can i can get into this so you know as i'm sure everyone else has they kind of develop a a sense of you know uh healthy paranoia <laughs> where you're like sneaking around each corner looking around making sure there's nobody about there to push a barrel down on top of you or you know get a surprise attack just like that guy was about to do um and uh, the more I read about the game, I didn't try to, I, I didn't like uh, min-max or metagame. I, I tried to play, enjoy the game a, as its own experience without kind of delving into the community too much because I figured that would be the most enjoyable way of getting into the game. But I did read that um, specifically in Demon Souls, there was a mechanic that uh, made it so the more you die, the world gets darker. <laughs> and so it actually gets harder the more you die which I thought was horribly punishing and really, really fitting for the game. 
Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm looking forward to the, uh, the first reveal of the Dark Souls, uh, sorry, De uh, Demon Souls remaster seemed to lose a lot of its atmosphere, which was another really big pa uh, part of the game. Um, I loved how just eerie and somber everything was in Demon Souls. And I think that the atmosphere in Demon's Souls still is the best of the series, even though the graphically it's dated a bit. You know, as you, as you can see now, uh, obviously it's not the highest quality video here, but it had a definitely um, a low frame rate, um, kind of low detail, but the environments were still stellar and are still stunning today. So, you know, um, I'm not a, uh, I don't consider myself a Soulsborn expert, but I definitely was one of the early adopters of uh, Demon Souls for PS3, and uh, yeah, I, I still to this day I'm terrified whenever I look at the the red eye uh, knights in the first area, or you know dragons, or uh, are that horrible, horrible. Um, I was like area two or area three where you had to like walk across um, wooden platforms and not try to fall because I would, you know, you died <laughs> essentially. I never thought a game would become a memes that fast, but yeah, especially. Demon Souls didn't really start. Uh, Demon Souls definitely started everything that uh, we now know as Soulsborne, but um, Dark Souls definitely got in the more memes because it it went it expanded from just the you know PlayStation owners to uh, PlayStation, Xbox, and PC players, and that's where that's where the the whole series really took off. But almost everything in Dark Souls was had its foundation in Demon Souls, so definitely an important part of gaming history. I'm slightly distorted. I tried to turn the uh, volume up. I'm hoping it's not too loud. I keep on getting like too quiet, too loud, whatever. Hopefully it's a little bit better. Um, yeah, I did a test here. It didn't sound too bad, but hopefully I'm not too distorted. Let me know if that's better. Um, I swear, live streams are going to be death of me. But, uh, yeah, so Demon Souls, uh, really, really fun game. Still probably, maybe it's a little bit of nostalgia, but I, I've, I have played it recently. Oh, yeah, by the, by the way, I should have mentioned my rules. Uh, my rules for uh, this, and these are just my arbitrary rules. No new games. So a game has to be at least three years or older, older to make this list. I did that because uh, new games can kind of have that sort of new shiny appeal, but usually after about three or so, you know, really more three to five years, uh, you kind of see how uh, long or how um, timeless the game is. So I made a rule about, you know, no games newer than three years. Um, I also did a, a um, I have to have played it within the last year or so. Um, some of these are a little bit of a stretch, but I, I have played, I think, 95% of these within the last year. Maybe a couple of them a little bit longer, but I can't just bank on the nostalgia. I'll actually have to have played it recently. Um, and another factor is um, it has to still be enjoyable as is today. So games that I can't revisit today, right now, and play I, are discounted. So, like, for example, I doubt... I, if I was a huge fan of Star Wars Galaxies, I couldn't put that on the list because it's not really playable at, in that condition today. So those are my my rules for this. Um, because I may like say, oh my God, Doom Eternal is the greatest game ever. But if, um, if it, in five or three to five years, if I, I realize, oh, you know what? There's actually a couple of mechanics and a couple of parts that weren't so great. So... Oh, I got all, all physical copies of all three Troika games. Yeah, um, actually, I didn't put any Troika games on here. I love them. I don't know if I'd call them my favorite games. They're definitely amazing games. Um, I probably should have put Vampire in here. Oh, well. Oh, well. Uh, like I said, I was kind of scrambling to put this list together, so I may have forgotten one or two games over the list. Anyway, so that was Demon's Souls. Rough overview. Um, definitely one of my... Um, Definite uh, greatest of all time games. It really was a huge game changer. I mean, it, it's rare when you when you uh, see the release, um, you know, firsthand of a a clone maker. You know, Demon Souls clone and Souls like games have become a genre. You know, like just like Minecraft before that, 
just like um, Diablo for the, before that, just like Doom before that, you know, games can start a whole series of clones and, and uh, wannabes. Um, all right. So let me go to the next one. Hopefully I've got here. All right. Okay, so far so good. Uh, I did not play Blade of Darkness. I've heard a lot about it. I've heard some good things about it, but I have not played Blade of Darkness. Here we got uh, Dungeon Keeper. Dungeon Keeper um, got that early uh, big box game back in the 90s. I don't know if I got it on release, but I got it within a year or two of release. Um, it It is such an interesting game because I had played uh Populous actually at the time I'd only played Populous on the SNES. Um, and I wasn't fully aware of the entire, um, bullfrog library at that point, but dungeon keeper really gripped me because of its, uh, of its selling point, which was that you get to go into dungeons as the bad guy, not, not the heroes, which I thought was awesome. In fact, you're actually building your dungeon around, uh, making it as horrible and as painful and as death ridden as possible for the heroes. The heroes were the bad guys. You're the dungeon keeper, which is, uh, an incredible pitch. And I'm surprised and people bought it or, uh, um, sold it to, uh, yeah, I guess, but, um, yeah, I know it. Dungeon keeper just had a perfect atmosphere. It totally felt like a dungeon crawler from the opposite side as a, as a sort of business simulation game slash God game from the side of, the baddies in the dungeon. So, you know, I played tens of RPGs by that point, used to the whole dungeon tropes and everything like that. But, um, just the idea where you start from like a basic, you have to dig your way out and you're even finding mysterious caverns and, and, you know, dark, decrepit, uh, abandoned places where monsters lurk and you might be able to take over those monsters. You might have to fight them. Um, and there are other dungeon keepers out there where you had to look out and make sure that you weren't going to get, uh, double crossed by them and you fortify and come up with like these death traps where you make these twisty corners and, and set a, a boulder trap to roll in and crush anybody that comes past. But yeah, I know it was an incredibly unique game. Um, it took ideas from uh, previous sim titles and business sims and things like that. And just added a really, really fun atmosphere, uh, fun and a uh, engaging theme and atmosphere. So he <laughs> said slapping the ends could, could have been a game in itself. Yeah, exactly. But uh, just some of the incredible things, uh, like I wasn't familiar with uh, Magic Carpet at the time. I think I played it, I think I played it a little bit later, or no, I think I played a demo of Magic Carpet from a, a PC Gamer de uh, demo disc. But um, when while they were building Dungeon Keeper with this, the Magic Carpet engine, they actually uh, utilized um, that powerful, the pa that power of the engine to make a first person mode. So any, every single creature in your dungeon, you can possess and control through first person, which is insane. Um, when I realized you could actually level up your guys and possess your vampires and your, your beetles and your, your, you know, bile demons and things like that and use all their abilities like a first person RPG, but every single monster was a, an RPG character. I thought that was just incredible. Like I've never seen, so many mechanics all bundled up in one game before really so yeah i know it was a, an incredible experience um uh unfortunately the best way to play the game is diff really difficult to play right now i think you might need a, a um a voodoo wrapper or something like that but that sounded weird but yeah 3dfx voodoo <laughs> the the video card but um you there was a version i think it was wit uh keeper 95 or something like that where you're able to run it within windows with a 3d accelerator but um, that, that version is really hard to play now. Hopefully, um, I don't think the GOG version will even lets you use it, but um, you can run it in, in uh, a relatively high resolution, but it's still a little bit limited. So yeah, it's an, unfortunately you can't play it the best way you uh, that it was available at the time just because of compa uh, compatibility reasons, but it still holds up really well, even despite the, the 2D sprite look. And... Um, Although a lot of people will say Dungeon Keeper 2 is superior and, you know, it's debatable. 
the atmosphere and the uh, the darker and the the grittiness of the first game was definitely my favorite. Um, keeper light game. Uh, I would say the best keeper light game is uh, War for the Overworld. That's the most similar to uh, Dungeon Keeper one and two, in my opinion. Um, Dungeons two and Dungeons three is pretty good. Uh, Empire. I wasn't really able to get into Empire that much. Uh, the controls and the interface was really weird. You actually had to go into a completely different interface to build stuff, then go back, and then, and then you had to control units manually. I, I would praise Empire for introducing the idea of going um, outside of the dungeon and back in with your guys. Um, that's but that's something that uh, Dungeons Two adopted, which was pretty cool. But um, it, it's so disconnected. Dungeons Two and Dungeons Three's overworld and underworld uh, gameplay is so disconnected; it feels like two different games. So uh, definitely War for the Overworld, especially I think you can buy the pack with all the expansions all free. And so it's basically, it's the closest thing we've got to Dungeon Keeper 3. So I definitely check it out. I haven't tried Keeper at RL. I'm assuming that's probably a, an expanded version. Uh, theme of games being grittier than their sequels seems like sense in movies. Yeah, same thing with Star Wars, same thing with Terminator, same thing with Alien. Well, one of the big things, the uh, reason why Alien and Aliens are so different is because Alien was done by Ridley Scott, a more somber kind of dark director, whereas Aliens was done by James Cameron, a more action sci-fi movie director. I mean, Terminator was still uh, still pretty dark, but um, James Cameron kind of turned it more into an action movie, whereas Alien was more of a slasher, so different vision, different, um, uh, themes and style. I mean, they're practically not even the same genre at that point, but, um, I think alien was definitely a better movie, but aliens was a better action film. Um, aliens scared the heck out of me when I was a kid too. Um, as far as uh, like star Wars and stuff, like people say star Wars was for kids. Rewatch Star Wars sometime. <laughs> there's like dismemberment. There's, uh, you know, some pretty, pretty nasty stuff in the, in, uh, those original movies. So, um, people that are trying to kind of clean it up and make it PG again and stuff. I mean, I think it was probably PG at the time because the ratings weren't the same as they are now, but yeah, it, it, I think as franchises get bigger, um, movie studios try to expand their audiences. And even though I watched Star Wars as a kid today, pushing something as violent as star Wars, um, to, and as a, a, a movie that treats you like an adult, like star Wars does relatively to the, uh, stuff the kids watch now, I think it's like, I think studios kind of talk down to children now. So I don't think they would, they would do something that level uh, as star Wars did. So yeah, I mean, you could go on, that's a whole discussion, but yeah, I think as games get more popular, they kind of make it a bit more charming, a little bit less serious, which is kind of annoying, but, um, all right. So that's dungeon keeper so far. So good. Uh, what do we got next? All right, here we got black and white. Um, another, well, not a bullfrog game, but it's a, um, it's another Peter Molyneux game. Uh, he actually self-funded this uh, from the beginning until he got a publisher. And I think that it's basically his magnum opus. Um, this was an incredibly anticipated game for me for a long time. I probably followed the development of this game for at least three years, which was incredible when I was, you know, at my age. But um, this game was almost like a... Uh, it was like basically a gigantic tech demo, almost a proof of concept of something larger. And then fortunately that larger thing never happened, but I can't think of a game which allows as much experimentation and interaction. I mean, I, I guess you could, you could say Minecraft with the, all of its, uh, you know, red bricks and things like that. You could probably get a little bit more, you could, you could actually program calculators and stuff in that game. But aside from something like that, much of a, a sandbox simulation um just the amount of the physical interaction the types of um tricks and ways you can kind of bend the gameplay in black and white is just 
almost unparalleled, especially from that level. Like a lot of games let you finagle with a lot of things from a pers- first person, whereas this, this is from like a God's perspective. So the entire map is like accessible and viewable at, the, at, at once, but your range is limited by your followers. And uh, you can watch them grow. They have names, they have um, jobs, they have families. Um, and it's just incredible to watch uh, your entire civilization bloom and grow over time. And uh, I love games like that where you can actually just kind of get emotionally attached to your, your villagers and stuff and kind of follow them around and, you know, help them out. Oh, you know, so-and-so is hungry. Let's, let's uh, throw him a goat or whatever, you know, kind of <laughs> play around in your kind of, you know, digital sandbox world. So, um, yeah, no, and, and uh, I cover this in my God game documentary. If you're interested in God games, I highly recommend that because it's like a feature length documentary I spent almost a half a year on. Um, it, I, I like like the visuals of black and white too are incredible. They're still looking great looking today. Um, but they definitely toned down the feature set. Like I would kind of compare it to fable fable Two. fable two is probably a, a superior experience, but fable one tried to do so much more than fable two did like fable two gave up on a lot of the, on a lot of the more ambitious aspects. And, uh, uh Molyneux kind of does that with his games. He kind of tones down his, his, ambition yeah there's a couple um i back to kickstarter of a game basically trying to be black and white um three or whatever had a pretty low budget but i think it was like a solo dev so maybe he'll get maybe he'll get uh, pretty far we'll see but it's an it's a lot of work because almost everything has some sort of interaction or or uh, physics to it I mean, I, I would say, I, I don't know if they used a, a pre-made engine for black and white. I thought that I got the idea that it was all kind of custom. So you'd probably be able to lean on Unreal Engine or Unity for a lot of the physics interactions if you're going to make a new game. But um, just all of the interactions, like everything interacts with each other. So, uh, you know, it's a fairly simple uh, basics. Like most of the resources are either food or... Um, uh, lumber. So, you know, you, you can convert trees into lumber or things like that. But, um, black and white two introduced, uh, ore, which was mostly a military resource, but, uh, you know, and obviously faith is your main resource. So the idea that you, you get people to pray to you and increase your, your, uh, your power that way. But all of the, uh, miracles you could do just really kind of add a, a huge level of interactivity to the game. Like you can, um, sprinkle, uh, rain over a farm to uh, increase the how fast it grows. Uh, you can do it with trees as well. It's actually like a, a tactic. Um, it, I don't think it was as balanced as it could be. I think you could probably patch the balance to make the game better. But if you ran out of trees, you'd kind of be boned. So sometimes you'd have to actually plant, move trees out, and then just water them so that. And if you a tree grew to maximum size, it would spawn smaller trees. So there's all these really crazy. Um, interactions and ideas that like you actually have to work about whether you're about the ecology of your island because you have finite resources really cool um yeah i know and and black and white 2 has some really really uh uh cool things like the like i, th- I forget what they're called the the more powerful miracles epic miracles right like creating volcanoes and hurricanes and stuff like that those are awesome um the first game didn't have those but i, I think the the core gameplay loop was more interesting in the first game even though it doesn't have the, the, you know, wars and battle mechanics and things like that. But yeah, if you could combine the best ideas of black and white and black and white two, I think it'd be, it'd be an incredible game for sure. Also black and white two didn't have multiplayer for some reason. Um, but yeah, no, probably my favorite, uh, God game of all time. Um, you know, uh, easily just, just an incredible experience. I really recommend trying it out. It's a bit hard to get a hold of right now. It's not as they haven't gotten the rights from GOG. GOG hasn't gotten access to it. Um, but if you look in the right places, you can usually find a pre-patched version that will run on modern systems. So definitely recommend checking that out. Um, let's see. Here we go. Next one.
All right. So this game might be familiar if you're a uh, Xbox 360 or PS3 fan. Um, one of my favorite shooters of all time. Uh, it was actually kind of a combination of classic um, stealth games like Thief the Dark Project and like a modern shooter. Uh, I don't know what, what you compare it to. Maybe like a, a Wolfenstein or uh, not like classic Wolfenstein, but, you know, modern shooter meets uh, stealth game with light mechanics but uh, on top of all that which was good enough like um the story was just super unique and really entertaining uh this is the darkness from uh i forget which year it is but the darkness from uh, xbox 360 and ps3 um <laughs> the game that describes any goes hard <laughs> yes yeah i'm dark inside um uh supernatural gangster uh, betrayal story. That's the darkness, which is super weird, but it works really well. And, uh, I'm sure if you're familiar with the game, um, the, it was voiced by, um, the lead singer to Epic. I think it was, is that the band name or no, that was the, their famous song. It was, um, I cannot remember anything about it. Lead singer, lead singer of, of a popular band in the nineties. Anyway, this guy has incredible voice control. Um, he plays the, uh, the titular darkness, which is this demon that infests, uh, the main character, I think on his 21st birthday. Faith. No, yeah. Matt, Mike Patton from faith no more. And their favorite, their uh, famous song is Epic. I think it was. Yeah, Mike Patton actually has done several uh, zombie movies and things like that, or just as the voice of the zombies, because he has incredible vocal control. And uh, he had so much life to the game, because uh, basically you play, um, I totally spaced out on the guy's name, but you play, the main character is a gangster who's celebrating his 21st birthday when he dies. Spoiler. Um, but he actually gets reborn as something other than human. He's basically possessed by the darkness, which is this demon that's been um, existing as like a parasite throughout time for a very long time. We don't know exactly how long. Um, but yeah, Jackie, I think it's Jackie, right? Um, yeah, uh, uh, early Starbreeze was amazing. Um, this game and, um, uh, also the surprisingly, the, uh, Chronicles of Riddick game are both of them, I guess are incredible, uh, stealth slash, uh, shooter games, which, um, follow very similar to this. I think, I like the setting and the story of this a lot better, but I played the, um, the, uh, butcher Bay and, um, something, something, whatever the sequel was years ago. And they're both great games. Um, yeah, he worked on left for dead as some of the zombies. Um, Mike Patton did anyway, his, his like, uh, the creepy things he can do with his voice are really good. And they've actually did very little filtering for the, uh, voice of the darkness. It was just mostly him. Um, but he has a ton of character to it. He's constantly telling you to do horrible things. And if you give in to those uh, desires to do horrible things, he'll like kind of like tease you and taunt you for it and everything like that. It's like, you know, then that feel good or whatever. You know, he do all these kind of creepy things. Um, but it's also some, like somewhat of a mild strategy game. It's really weird. You can actually, like you see on the screen there, you can summon little demon uh, allies uh, to help you like, you know, tackle people. I think one of them, uh, I forget exactly all, everything they do, but they, they'll help you out in, in various puzzles and in battles. And you have these two um, demon heads you can actually grab people with. And if you uh, grab a, an enemy and, and chomp their heart out, you gain power. You ev eventually also get tentacles you can like whip people up with and grab people and do all sorts of other elements with. There's also a, a kind of remote control tentacle you can use to get through vents and things to do certain puzzles and to get certain places. Really creative game and a very unusual setting. You can also like whip or shoot uh, lights out because the 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 darkness fee, uh, is the strongest in the dark. If there's more lights on uh, Jackie in the darkness, he's weaker. So that's a mechanic. So you actually want to make sure the world is as dark as possible. Um, the one flaw I'd say with the game, other than never getting a PC release, which I'm still mad about, it never never came to PC, uh, is that it is kind of hard to see a little bit when you're in the darkness. They kind of tried to fix that in the sequel. The sequel took a more kind of cartoonish look to it, um, but they basically made the darkness purple light rather than actually being dark, which I think really ruined a lot of the atmosphere. 
Like you'll see a lot of just plain dark or almost black throughout the game, the original game in the sequel, it just gets purple. And I, I just, I don't think that works quite as well thematically, even though gameplay wise, you can see better. I, I don't know. I think there was a, there's probably a happy medium there somewhere where they could have gotten to. Yeah. Darkness two is definitely different. It was much more like a gra uh, graphic novel style feeling game a little bit, a little bit lighter in the tone. I, I definitely like the original better, but, uh, Darkness 2 had a PC port, which plays in cr much, much better than the uh, the 30 FPS uh, console versions do, but worth playing them. But if you can get your hands on the original, I definitely recommend it. But yeah, you see he's like popping lights out um, to make sure it's all dark and, and uh, you know, his darkness powers are all the max. But yeah, you can even create like s small singularities with your darkness uh, eventually. But I won't spoil more, much of the game, but yeah, eventually you get to learn a lot about the lore about the darkness just enough to get you really interested in the lore and the history, but not enough to like come get you bored of the idea. Like it, 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 it teases you in enough of the lore to make you want more basically. So definitely recommend the darkness. I really hope they get a remaster or something at some point, but having heard of the state that uh, Starbreeze is in, I have no idea where that would come from. So we will see on that, but yeah, the darkness is a great game. One of my favorite shooters. Okay, let's see what we got over here. Uh, all right, well, this game um, was one of my most anticipated for years. Um, it came out, and I was originally disappointed by it, but uh, the more I played it, the, uh, the more I actually realized how much... Um, I liked it. Basically, the uh, the division was what was that? Twenty sixteen, I think. Twenty fifteen, twenty fourteen. I don't remember which year it was. Um, definitely came out later than it was supposed to, but it was uh, definitely my highlight of that year. At its core, it's basically a looter shooter from third person um, with like mild stealth elements and things like that. But um, it, it's just a really, really incredible atmosphere, really incredible um, gameplay, and also very timely uh, setting, as we can see over there with the crazy pandemic and, you know, uh, uh, sy systemic collapse and things like that. Um, yeah, no, it, very, very... Uh, basically, the game would have gotten delayed or canceled had it been released in 2020. Let me put it that way. Um uh, man, I haven't heard of One Must Fall 2097 for a long time. That was that old uh, DOS fighting game, right? Um, let me yeah, skip to the gameplay here. Yeah, so looter shooter, not incredibly unique, but um, extreme attention to detail, great atmosphere, still one of the best looking games ever, I think, um, especially if you play it at night with the uh, graphics turned up. You get the particle lighting and then get the snowflakes lit by all the police lights and the warning lights and everything like that. Just an incredibly, um, I hate to, use, to keep on abusing that word atmospheric, but that's, that's what it is. It's just a really amazing immersive experience. Um, probably up there with uh, destiny as far as some of the most interesting uh, UI decisions. Your UI is actually kind of like, um, uh, dead space it actually floats in real and 3d space along with your your character and if you like uh if you lean against a wall the cover will actually stick to the wall again uh and align itself with the wall a lot of little things like that like all the navigation points are actually uh 3d uh, vector lines in the actual game world and um yeah just a amazing um uh, the sort of volumetric um lighting smoke effects particle effects and uh, the shooting is also feels really good. Um, uh, the the problem is that later later uh, on the game does have very bullet spongy enemies, but um, very interesting setting. Definitely not the best, most accurate Tom Clancy game. <laughs> Definitely not that. I mean, you can you can shoot um, le higher level thugs in the head um, point blank and not kill them. So. Um, yeah, 2016. Hey, Game of Matt. Yeah, we played a Game of Matt, and I played a, a, a stream of D Division not too long ago, actually. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's uh, definitely imperfect, but it was 
an, a very enjoyable experience to me, and I thought it had a really uh, interesting, if albeit flaw, uh, imperfectly implemented multiplayer idea. Like the Dark Zone, I think was um, great idea, just that execution wasn't quite there um, with the cheaters and stuff like that. But the idea that you can fight over really, really good loot and be betrayed at any point in time, I th I'd like to see more games kind of play around with that. Uh, for love it or hate it, Ubisoft definitely has been trying some of the most unique ideas in multiplayer uh, competitive gaming as of late between the Assassin's Creed games and their kind of um, hide-and-go-seek sort of uh, assassin gameplay to the Division's uh, Dark Zone where you're fighting over loot and, you know, having to extract your, your uh, items in a dangerous uh, PvP area to... Um, uh, you know, the kind of destructive gameplay of uh, Siege, you know. Uh, Ubisoft has definitely been kind of pushing the boundary of, of at least mainstream uh, multiplayer competitive gaming. Um, not just competitive, but just PvP gaming. Um, yeah, Tom Clancy died a long time ago. Um, I think at least 10 years ago. I'd have to double check. But yeah, no, by before then, he'd actually sold his name his actual name brand to Ubisoft. But most people don't remember that to, uh, total Tom Clancy, actually most writers and stuff just like sign off the rights to everything and have very little involvement. Tom Clancy actually co-founded, I think it was Red Storm. Was it Red Storm Entertainment or I might be getting that mixed up, but he, he, he co-founded a, a game developer company and co-created the original, um, uh, Rainbow Six game. Most people don't remember that, but he actually, uh, founded the the studio that did that. So he was actually pretty into the, the gaming market at the beginning. After a while, I think he pretty much got almost completely hands off of it. And he'd probably consider, uh, from a realism standpoint, he'd probably consider uh, the division sort of a travesty. <laughs> but I'm sure he would probably appreciate the setting, but not the gameplay. Yeah, I know Tom Clancy is interesting. From what I remember, uh, I don't think he ever served in the military, but he was one of the most thorough researchers um, to ever uh, write books. Like he would be incredibly detailed and learn about a lot of real life military operations and things. That's why people loved his books so much is because he would put a lot of real life inspired um, terminology and uh, knowledge behind his writing. Um and that made his stuff interesting, kind of like Dan Brown. I don't think Dan Brown's a particularly great writer, but he does a lot of research, and his research really shines through in his writing. But um, yeah, no, uh, uh, definitely not a a realistic uh, tactical shooter like um, the early Rainbow Six games, and you know, uh, you could argue early Splinter Cell games and stuff like that. But uh, Division was a fun ge uh, core gameplay loop, great with friends, um, kind of tense uh backstabby multiplayer but also uh an incredibly realized uh, miniaturized version of new york or brooklyn i should say and or actually no that most of it doesn't not not most of it's not in brooklyn most of it's in manhattan i should correct myself the tutorial is in brooklyn i think this part is in brooklyn here but uh manhattan is the primary location Um, but yeah, no, um, I totally acknowledge its flaws. Um, many people have said its flaws, but it's still one of my favorite experiences. Um, and I probably clocked at least 200 hours into it. So, yeah. Um, especially, uh, not many got to, not many people got to play it, but the survival mode was also really, really just desolate, grim, bleak, and awful, but really immersive and interesting. I wish more, I wish that would have taken off more. Um, I haven't gotten through Division 2 all the way, but so far, uh, I think the change of setting and the kind of less serious tone to the game kind of irked me a little bit. But um, still, original still stands strong as a, one of my favorite uh, looter shooters ever, uh, if, if only just from a really incredible setting and atmosphere. Oh, yeah, I heard the latest Ghost Recon was terrible. Yeah, I, I'm not going to touch that. Um, all right, so next one up, let's see if this one works. And here we go. Total Annihilation. Uh, for those lucky enough to play it at launch, 
Um, definitely runs at a uh, way too small. <laughs> it's way too small pixels uh, for modern resolutions. Uh, I always have to change it whenever I'm playing it on GOG now. But I found a, a gameplay of a, a lower resolution version so you can actually see the units. Um, oh, Bad North was made by the guy who did uh, 3D Map for Division. Weird. Interesting. Small world, right? Uh, anyway, um, Total Annihilation is probably, if I had to, if I was faced at gunpoint, I'd probably say Total Annihilation is my favorite RTS of all time. It's probably the only RTS I've actually played both campaigns all the way through, um, which is saying a lot. Um, and uh, it it's hard to describe why Total Annihilation is so cool, but I'll try to explain it. Um, for one thing you start out with a kind of powerful base unit um, that is kind of interesting. Normally you start out with like peasants or, or, you know, peons or whatever, or some basic grunt unit. But here you actually start out with a very powerful base unit who's your core builder and has a uh, really destructive uh, special attack. His basic attack is just like little lasers. But you actually expend a lot of your energy. There's two resources, metal and energy. And that's really interesting how you get those resources. Um, your basic commander and most other basic uh, uh, core units can uh, look for like ore or metal in the hills and extract that. Or any, every, <laughs> I'm jumping on myself, every single unit in the game are robots or at least like mechs basically. Um, so, but when they die, they don't disappear. They leave wreckage and debris. You can extract that debris and recycle that as, as metal. And there, uh, yeah, there's like a little metal spot right there. He's building a metal extractor. That's like one of your core materials, but uh, resources aren't really like finite prices. Like in most other games, like in say like Warcraft, you can't build X building until you have X resources. And that's, that's it. In Command Conquer, you cannot build your power plant until you have exactly 500, you know, uh, you know, whatever, $500 uh, or whatever. In Total Annihilation, you can actually start building anything at any time. But if you do not have a sufficient flow of resources, it will take much longer or will just kind of halt after a time. So buildings require quite often energy to build, uh, metal to build, and time. And the more energy and more um, metal you have, it'll actually accelerate the building process. Every single one of those plants and trees, you can actually harvest for energy. You convert uh, organics to energy and any like uh, rubble, debris, or uh, wreckage of, of, the, of your units or other units um, into metal. And so it's a really natural kind of organic way of collecting resources. Um, but you can also like build, a, um, you can also build water, like hydro plants. You can also build geothermal plants. You can also build solar um, uh, energy plants. You can also build wind energy plants. And wind will pick up and change direction and do different things depending on like the, the the geography and the time of day and everything like that. It's just really like tons of depth just on collecting resources. You know, like when you, when you compare a game like this to Warcraft, Warcraft, you can go to gold mines and you can chop down trees. That's it. This game, there's like so many layers to actually collecting resources. Like in a pinch, I would actually go out with my commanders, uh, my commander and a couple of construction units and just like suck up the remnants of a previous battle just so I can get enough metal to build my next army, you know, things like that. This game also had an incredible amount of units. Um, I, I forgot the exact number, but more units than pretty much any other RTS at the time. Uh, tons of different uh, styles of uh, flying units, um, tons of different types of de uh, defensive buildings, uh, tons of different types of ground troops, uh, ground vehicles, um, everything you could think of, you know, they all had a very different purpose. Uh, you had like bombers, you had fighters. My favorite uh, flying units were the brawlers, I think, where, which they kind of, um, they're kind of like VTOL kind of hover ships that could kind of shoot like, uh, like Vulcan cannons down on enemies. Um, yeah, it was all about a game about ex experimentation and, uh, yeah, I just had a, an, a really interesting, I think you could even like help build units quicker if you used your commander to like help aid them or whatever. Oh yeah, and the commander also has the ability where you can expend a, bu a burst of energy, actual energy resources into like a really powerful one-shot um, cannon. 
So you can actually risk uh, a lot of, uh, be very dangerous and risk your commander and possibly take out a base really easily. The caveat though, is if your commander dies, you lose. So uh, playing with that resource, protecting your commander while also occasionally using your commander for a really uh, powerful advantage, really interesting game. And um, yeah, shame, uh, sadly, after the expansions, they made a, a, a spinoff, Total Annihilation Kingdoms, sort of a medieval spinoff. Wasn't as good, although it tried some other cool things, in my opinion. Um, kind of was succeeded by Supreme Commander, but for life of me, I couldn't get into those as much as I could at uh, TA. So definitely one of my favorite uh, RTS games of all time. Um, hopefully you guys agree with that. It's I think it was a really, really... Uh, experimental interesting period of time where it could try just about anything and yeah cave dog was awesome at the time i heard that they're going to make a uh, some sort of rts uh based on caveman days or like medieval or uh prehistoric but i don't think that ever happened all right next one up here Assassin's Creed. Um, I picked the original because I think the original had the most interesting setting and had the most, the clearest artistic vision. Uh, essentially, you play, well, it's interesting. It's got two layers to the game. Uh, you're introduced to the game as like a, a crusader age uh, assassin in, in the Middle East. And you're basically fighting the, the, uh, the the templars and um as you can see i mean the the graphics for the time were really really incredible just had a really clean uh the cloth the cloth effects and stuff like that were really well done obviously a artist's type uh artist driven game um not the most incredible uh stealth game in the in the world but i would argue it has a really strong um setting uh, you know uh, where you go to Damas and these other uh, cities at the time get to explore. And you're, you're always kind of like at foot level, like it, a lot of games you kind of feel, you kind of feel separate from the world. This one really integrates you in the world. Like you actually have to blend in with crowds, um, find um, places where you'd be less conspicuous and uh, plan your method of attack and your method of approach each time. And that's what made the game most interesting to me is how much the world was your um wasn't just window dressing like every single npc could be potentially a a benefit or a problem uh they toned it down a lot in the later games but the original game actually you'll see here as he's running he actually gets knocked back every time he has he uh, hits somebody while he's running and if you actually run uh too recklessly you'll actually uh get knocked over and tumble onto the ground and then the guards can actually approach you and uh fighting guards in this game is actually tough especially before you get um counterattack counterattack's pretty op but before you gain those abilities uh two or three guards ganging up onto you can actually spell your death uh this get this guy is pretty good but um yeah and counterattacks are ridiculously op but the idea was there that you should actually just run from the guards which is super interesting and very few games actually um, hold to their guns like that. I'd say uh, Thief the Dark Project, um, this game early on at least, and uh, maybe a couple others, but even games like Dishonored gave you enough um, ammunition and weaponry to, to face off against guards without uh, much trouble. But I think the idea of a successful stealth game is that there's a lot of risk in fighting something. Because why would you bother sneaking around if you can take him out really easily? <laughs> yeah, counterattack the game. Once you get counterattack in AC, it definitely kind of becomes uh, a lot easier. But um, it still requires timing and stuff like that. But yeah. No, a really, really cool game. And you'll notice that the actual interface is almost non-existent in this game. I don't know if it was turned off in this gameplay. But um, I think there was like a little health bar at the corner. But it was really minimalistic uh, UI. Uh, very much a sort of cinematic um, experience. And yeah, just pulling off a really well-executed assassination was just a, an incredible feat. 
climbing up uh, buildings, um, creeping over the roofs and, and jumping down for your, your attack, especially if you've already distracted or secretly taken out other, other enemies on the way. Um, but yeah, no, really great game. Uh, AC2 is also really good, but um, it started to kind of introduce the overpoweredness of your main character, whereas AC1, you still felt vulnerable, at least earlier in the game. One of my favorite experiences. And uh, yeah, Assassin's Creed. I want to do a playthrough again uh, at some point um, and uh, maybe uh, on a live stream or something like that. Maybe the PC version. That could be a lot of fun. Okay. So the stream has now been augmented. So as you saw on the, uh, the front there, uh, Deus Ex. Um, this game kind of came out of nowhere. I didn't really know much about, um, Iron Storm at the time. Uh, I knew that, you know, I thought Iron Storm was the same guys who made, uh, Daikatana, but <laughs> I didn't realize the difference series or whatever, but, um, this was kind of Warren Spector's baby. Basically, if you don't know the story, uh, Warren Spector was, uh, essentially approached by John Romero of Iron Storm. He had a lot of funding and, and, uh, money at the time from his doom quake, uh, days and and you know what that'll the kind of doors those will open but uh he basically said hey warren you can make your dream game if you come with me and this was this was one specter's dream game uh it was almost a continuation of games like system shock system shock 2 things like that uh more like system shock because Warren specter had nothing to do with system shock 2 but uh cyberpunk um immersive sim first person shooter action slash stealth slash hacking slash sandboxy uh cyberpunk uh espionage game and uh it was really brilliant uh, despite it being actually a little bit behind the times at the time even um deus ex yeah just the the immense amount of freedom you had um anything from even the very first level which i don't consider a great level and almost turned me off of the game you can even like stack boxes depending on your character's strength, you could stack boxes and move them around and climb over walls you weren't supposed to, things like that. Uh, almost anything you could think of within the world um, could be done with uh, within the, the elements that were there. So if you found, if you found uh, some items uh, that you uh, saw on level, almost everything is interactive, everything can be picked up, almost every light item can be thrown if you have enough strength. So you can grab like a, a vase, toss it and, and crash and get somebody's attention. You can, um, one time I, I, I remember I famously, or not famously, I uh, distinctly remember uh, pushing a gas barrel off a ledge onto and two stories down onto some um, enemy soldiers. And uh, that that was like one way to take out a bunch of guys without using any ammo. Uh, you can get you can get all sorts of cybernetic augmentations, you know, increase your strength, uh, see in the dark, um, you know, breathe underwater, all these kind of things. And uh, those really added a sense of flavor. Like it, you can pump up your your speedy um, legs and, and run faster. You, um, I think you can like amp up your your uh, resistances to certain elements. Um, I think there's a strength module and things like that. So, yeah, there are a lot of a lot of great aspects there. But beyond just like the, the physical, there was also um, not the most elaborate stealth engine. I think Thief the Dark Project still had a more elaborate stealth engine into the game, but it had a fairly fairly competent stealth um, for the most part. Non-lethal playthroughs were definitely difficult to pull off, but it is possible. It is possible to be the game, I think, with only three or four deaths in the entire game. Uh, I mean, kills in the entire game, which is impressive for a, a shooter like that. But the level design is really what elevates Deus Ex to any to a whole new uh, range of its own. Basically, like every level, I think it was either Warren or somebody else, possibly Harvey uh, Smith, who worked on the game, um, made it a rule where each level has to be completed, completed at least three three more different ways. So no level has one option of success, which made the game really really interesting because you never were stuck in a position where it's like oh man i can't get past this part you're always like okay what are what am i not seeing um i can't tell you how many play times i've played through the deus ex games and uh 
like pushed a box and found a whole new vent system. I never even knew it was there. Like every single compartment, um, building, uh, apartment complex sewer, uh, everything has like ventilation shafts. They have cupboards. You can open up and grab snacks out of They have refrigerators that have soda in them. They have working ATMs. You can hack to get cash out of, they have, uh, soda machines. You can hack to get <laughs> soda out of, they have, um, you know, uh, doors that are locked that you either have to pick or, um, keypads. You have to find out the key, uh, key, uh, code to, or hack with your, your hacking tools. Um, just, it, it felt like a living, breathing world you had access to, and there were limitations and things like that, but everything had a, a potential solution, which made the game really, really interesting. I think that Warren Spector, uh, described his perfect game or his ideal game, which would be like a, a single city block, which was completely interactive. Like his, his sort of, uh, gameplay design is almost like the polar opposite of like, um, uh, rock stars, uh, game design style. Rockstar likes to make a big world. That's on, that's kind of shallow. Whereas Warren Spector likes to make an incredibly immersive, small, concise world that has interactivity up the, up the yin yang, basically like. Um, you can flip on and off light switches on walls, on lamps, you can turn on faucets, you can turn on uh, toilets and the game remembers a lot of little things. You don't really even know you're being recorded. Like famously in one of the first uh, missions after the first mission, you can actually go to, um, the UNATCO base. And if you accidentally go into the, or accidentally or intentionally go into the woman's bathroom, uh, a woman sees you and notices, and she actually reports it to your boss who will, who will comment on it in your next, next meeting, things like that. So yeah, no, Deus Ex is great. The whole series is great. I actually, uh, uh I loved uh, Deus Ex Invisible War despite its major, major flaws, but, um, yeah, the entire series is, is great. Although I wouldn't say Deus Ex is one of my favorite games. I definitely enjoyed it. Yeah. Some of the key codes I still remember too. But, um, yeah, one of the best immersive games, immersive Sims of all time, it just, it didn't really hold anything back. I just tried to do everything that it set out to do. Um, arguably my favorite game of all time. Uh, I, that kind of changes from day to day, but yeah, Deus Ex definitely had a, uh, a long time. I mean, it's already, uh, what, 20 years old, I think, you know, if it's held up that well over this amount of time it's definitely worth worth putting on the, the greatest of all time list so that goes to the uh 2011 was the 2011 um sequel um technically i mean there was deus ex human or, or uh, deus ex invisible war in between that made some mistakes definitely went more console focused and it also um it kind of soured the uh you know uh, poisoned the well enough that the actual Deus Ex 3 that was supposed to be made got canceled. So it was on put on the ice for a while until um, Eidos Montreal came along and tried it, and they took their time with, with Human Revolution. And I would say they're probably like 90, 95% successful. I think they actually improved the Deus Ex formula in a lot of ways. Um, you know, interfaces obviously improved, and they actually did something really commendable. Um, they made an interface, I, if I recall correctly, they made an interface for consoles and a complete PC oriented interface for PCs. So it actually plays really well on PCs and really well on consoles. I had no problems really with the interface when I was playing it on the Xbox 360 at the time, but playing on PC, it's got, you know, the one through zero number, uh, boxes at the bottom. It's got a complete mouse, you know, UI and everything. It's actually quite playable on both so that they, they knew their audience and that there's a lot of people, a lot of PC gamers in particular who really, really loved Deus Ex the original. And I'd say uh, human revolution is definitely more Deus Ex one than Deus Ex two. Although it does make some uh, fairly drastic changes uh, to certain things like um, probably the most contentious thing about uh, human revolution for me was its power system. Uh, you've essentially had like little bars. I don't think it's, it's getting cut off in, in, uh, my podcast layout overlay, but you have little bars of energy and, uh, you consume a bar to do a special move. That special move could be 
using augmentation ability, or it could be um, like a takedown. Um, they had like uh, silent takedowns or lethal takedowns and things like that, which had to use a little bit of energy bar. And your first energy bar regenerates, but after that you have to use items to regenerate more. Um, I think that that, particularly with me, that kind of plays on my, uh, my play style. It, it kind of rubs me raw because I hoard <laughs> consumable items like potions. In this case, they have like power bars or like energy bars or whatever. I always hoard those. So I'd never use them. So that what that did is that made me slow down my gameplay. Like the first few missions I tried to ghost in this game. So I would like wait for my bar to charge up, sneak around, shoot a guy, silent takedown, whatever, then wait for it to charge up in a corner and do it, do it again. So it basically just slow down gameplay. That's the only, that's the only thing. And that might just be my style of gameplay, but otherwise, um, this game is a aesthetic masterpiece. I think it, it really kind of, they definitely go hard on the Amber, uh, color tone, but, uh, even today, I mean, it, it just has a really, really, uh, sleek look to it. Um, almost 10 years on it, it still has a very, uh, attractive look. It has sort of a Neo Victorian, like you can tell in his shoulder pads, there's like sort of a, a um, uh, Damas, a semi-translucent Damas pattern in, uh, on his shoulder pads. People have a kind of weird, unusual, um, clothing style. And I think that was actually a good call on their part. One thing that I didn't like from the original Deus Ex game going back is how modern it looks. It doesn't look very futuristic aside from the actual, you know, cybernetically enhanced soldiers. Of course, the, there's a lot of wood everywhere and it has a fairly plain, um, architecture. Whereas this game definitely went over and above to kind of go really interesting with its architecture and its, its fashion. So yeah, <laughs> it's a fallout. It has the fallout new Vegas sort of, uh, thing. It's either very blue or very, uh, orange, which, you know, it, it, it's, you could argue that that's good color, uh, good color integration, but it is what it is. But, um, one thing that the game really did very well, which I think is in this gameplay clip, um, I had to double check, but one thing the game did really, really well was, uh, it actually expanded the, uh, hacking system from the original Deus Ex into, uh, a much more elaborate mini game, which had, you know, various nodes and, and, uh, a lot more mechanics to it. Whereas the original hacking game, I, I, if, uh, you could basically, um, connect the nodes or, uh, I think you'd use a tool to bypass it. This one, uh, has a lot more different programs you can use. It really kind of emulates the cyberspace hacking atmosphere a lot more. And, uh, essentially you could be backtraced and backtracing was more gradual. It wasn't just like an instant you failed. It was more of a gradual thing. So the kind of panic sets in when you're almost there to the points you need to get to, but they're backtracing you halfway, halfway back. And you're like, Oh no, you know, I better hurry up or I better use a certain program and freeze somewhere or whatever. But, um, no, they, they obviously were very true to the original game. And I'd say like 90% of the way, um, they did have improve things too. you know, 10, 10 years of, uh, of tech will do that. Um, the gunplay was a lot better. They had more, I'd say, um, I'd argue Deus Ex Human Revolution had more better stealth mechanics. Um, it seemed like you could actually sneak around a lot easier without being kind of prey to a weaker AI of the original game. Um, you could definitely cheese your way through with, uh, stealth kills and, and, uh, takedowns and things like that. But, um, it, it definitely has a more polished experience in a lot of ways. The one thing I didn't like is that not everything's interactive in the game. There's a lot of just like random, uh, props and things like that. You can't pick up and throw around. Like in the original game, you can like go into practically any room. You can even go to the Netco offices and just trash the place like a rock star. You just like flip over chairs, toss lights, you know, break things and, you know, break glass and everything like that, where there's definitely a lot less, I'll bet, uh, it's still pretty interactive, but there's less interactive objects in human revolution. So yeah, I know it, it, it was like two steps forward one step back, basically, um, human revolution. I think it was in the right direction, but it definitely did, uh, negate some of the things you could do, um, in the original games. But yeah, I mean, they, they have like all the cool, like internet logs and things lying around. They definitely did a lot and they had a whole email system that was more elaborate than the original game. Um, 
true immersive game. I don't think it was dumbed down per se. I just think that they, they made some sacrifices along the way, possibly just budgetary or if I thought it wasn't important enough to dedicate hours and hours of manpower to. Um, but the fact that the environments, the AI, the shooting, um, and the stealth was arguably improved, um, in my, my opinion, fairly dramatically, uh, I'd say it's a worthy, a worthy sequel or prequel, I guess, in this case to the original games and kind of gave it, it was definitely had the reboot because it, it was a kind of a reboot because it kind of, it, it had the Star Wars prequel effect in that it was very n- much newer and sleeker and different looking than its predecessors. <laughs> But I think they did a good job with it. Um, and it definitely set the stage for an even better sequel, for sure. Um, next up. And of course, the next reboot, or the, the sequel to the reboot, uh, Mankind, or, uh, Mankind Divided, still a, an incredible looking game. It's a few years old now, but it, it's still uh, one of the better game looking games out there, I think. It was, again, one step forward, one step back. Um, the, bit, the main sticking point that people have with this game is that the story wasn't as good as Human Revolution, and that it's basically missing a third act, which I agree are not great things but one thing this game does i would agree i would argue better than any other game in the series is level design actually um the kind of check uh city you're in is all like interconnected between the rooftops between um windows between the sewers between the alleys and everything it really approaches that sort of um Warren Spector style, uh, one block, uh, sand, bo- one block sandbox that he was going for. Um, easily one of the most interconnected and elaborate, uh, hub, hub, hub level designs I've, uh, played. Um, and that's probably the best thing I could say about it is it's, is it really has immaculate and interconnected level design. Like the first level, I think you're in the middle East and that's fine. It's a, it's a good day of sex level, but when you get into the actual cityscapes and areas, those are really interesting. And because they're so vast and so elaborate and so interconnected, you can like climb through out a window along a ledge into another window, into an apartment and go into a completely different area. And it feels like you're actually peeking into somebody's private life. You know, I'd say that uh, Deus Ex and actually surprisingly, um, uh, invisible war Deus Ex two had re- possibly even better, um, uh, apartment level design. It was more broken up. It wasn't as uh, open and, and large as the original game, but Invisible War had some great uh, kind of inner inner city sort of uh, environments and levels that had, you know, vents and various connected apartments and buildings and things. But uh, Mankind Divided did that only, like, I think even better. Okay, I accidentally climbed through this elaborate uh, uh, sewer system down in and snuck up onto a boss of a mission without even realizing it was a boss. Took him out and realized, oh man, I was actually supposed to go there a completely different way. But because it's all interconnected and I managed I managed to find a hidden opening into the sewer, I managed to avoid like 50 guards that way. <laughs> so it's a really, really interesting uh, man making game. And it's got to be extremely time consuming and probably pretty expensive to do it that way. And sadly, uh, because the game wasn't a, as much of a hit as Human Revolution, it basically put the series on ice, which is really unfortunate because I'd say Mankind Divided is an incredible game, despite its uh, being cut short. So, you know, it's an incredible two-thirds of a game, basically. <laughs> if you can deal with that, especially on sale, I mean, I don't see any reason not to try it out. It's uh, still a great uh, Deus Ex game, and I, as somebody cleverly said, I forget who it was in one live stream, was that, even the worst Deus Ex game is still a great game, which as long as you're not counting uh, the fall as a Deus Ex game, which who would who would right? Uh, I'd say I'd say that's absolutely true. Yeah, this one I think incre- improves the the shooting a bit more. I think you got a little more parkour and stuff now, and you, you still got the liftable items and stuff. But I was also frustrated by like going to my apartment; only half the objects were were uh, interactive, which was a bit disappointing. 
but it still has that sort of next level environment feel and everything. And it also does some interesting things with dialogue. I, I think you actually are able to qu complete miniature objectives with the dialogue um, and get experience and things for it, which was nice. Um, playing with some of the more RPG elements of the series. Yeah, Project Snowblind was supposed to be another Deus Ex game, but it got it got kind of rebranded and reformed into more of an action game, but there are definitely traces of Deus Ex. Um, Mandalore Gaming did a video on that. I'd recommend checking that out. It was really good. Um, so yeah, um, basically any of the Deus Ex games, you can't go wrong, but if I was held at gunpoint, I would probably say Deus Ex, Human Revolution... Uh, mankind uh, divided and then invisible war. Um, but even invisible war, I'd still give like a seven out of 10 or seven or like an eight out of 10 or whatever. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a great, it's a great uh, addition to the series. It's just sad that they got kind of screwed over by either time budget or publisher deal or whatever. Also had a terrible, I think uh, this one had a terrible DLC pro program that probably hurt the, game sales as well so you know marketing and uh, publisher deals can can really uh, uh mess you up just as much as uh, internal development can so it's too bad because it's actually a really great game and i'd recommend checking it out so this is uh arcane studios prey arcane studios uh is basically trying to be looking glass 2.0 <laughs> they've been making uh, uh different uh, Looking Glass style games, they tried to make a uh, essentially Ultima Underworld 3 with um, their first game, Arx Vitalis. Then uh, they tried basically doing that again with, um, didn't they do uh, um, Dark Messiah of Might and Magic? I believe they did. Um, that was another kind of take on the Ultima Underworld take. And then they tried to do Thief with Dishonored and Dishonored 2. And then Prey is basically their attempt of doing System Shock. They've ba basically been going through the list of Looking Glass games and we're trying to recreate them for a new audience, which is um, pretty cool. Uh, Prey is not without its flaws, but uh, I think it's uh, definitely worth uh, checking it out on, in terms of being one of the best uh, immersive sims of the last 10 years. I would say it's not as good as the, the Deus Ex uh, mainline games, um, at least better than uh, Human Revolution, Mankind, Divided, and the original, but um, it does some pretty interesting things. I think the biggest flaw with Prey is I don't think... I think the setting and the enemies, uh, the the, the uh, mimics and things like that, where they'll they'll shape, shorm, shape shift into various items. I think that's a super cool idea and I, and I love the implementation of it. That doesn't quite fit with the stealth system. That's my biggest complaint of the game. I think the stealth system and the setting have a little bit of a little bit of a disconnect. I think that it would have been better if you had more humanoid enemies uh, that were a bit more predictable because stealth requires you to have some more prediction. Like I'd, I'd argue the same way with the end of uh, Thief the Dark Project and that um, toward the end of the Thief the Dark Project, uh, you get to see more kind of semi-Lovecraftian um, slash monstrous enemies, and I think the game gets less fun because of it. Whereas in the beginning, you're fighting more humanoids, which you can kind of predict. They speak their mind. You know, it's like, uh, you know, why'd that torch go out? Must have been the wind kind of thing. You know, they kind of talk amongst themselves. And so you can kind of predict what they're going to do or what they're thinking. Whereas monsters are more... They're definitely scary, and it's cool to kind of sneak around the bigger enemies and stuff like that, but um, it definitely makes uh, stealth a bit less... Um, you get less feedback, I guess. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. You don't always know when an enemy is about to come after you. Yeah, yeah, you can't really stealth the mimic so much. So that's my complaint about it, but um, at its heart, it's absolutely a, a um, immersive sim um you know the whole email thing i think it even has like the famous code that you implement in one of the doors it's absolutely a system shock you know successor if it doesn't quite rise to the same level of interactivity system shock it does have incredible level level design and it has um like system shock too it has a really interesting branching progression system where you can become like an engineer you become more of a stealth guy you can become a running gunner 
And depending on your uh, particular build and play style, you'll experience a very different version of the game. Like if you're a running gunner, you're going to be shooting guys, you're going to be throwing grenades, you're going to be, you know, recycling everything you find uh, in the game world to make more bullets. You're going to be doing all that kind of stuff. If you're a stealth type person, you're going to be uh, hacking, you know, hacking things. If you want to, you can hack the turrets and use those uh, against enemies, which I did. I thought that was super fun being able to hack and repair turrets um, uh, as like an engineer type. Um, but yeah, no, there, there's a lot of different angles you can take at the game. And again, there's like, there's vents, there's other avenues that are blocked off if you don't have that skill set. So revisiting the world as a different type of uh, character is super entertaining since the game is really replayable. And if you play the game once, you're actually doing a disservice to yourself because you're only getting like a third of the game. <laughs> when, you re when you replay it again as a different type of character, you're seeing a whole other angle to how you could have played. And I think that's probably why the, the immersive sim um, type of game is not as popular to the mainstream is because people don't quite get, they get like an, an experience, but not, it's not the experience. Like when you play a game like God, the God of War reboot, you're getting a very specific experience. But when you're playing an immersive spin, uh, sim, you may be getting an imperfect experience, but a unique one. So I think that's what kind of makes those games most interesting to me, but I can see how the average player may not appreciate that as much. So yeah, um, despite its flaws, Prey does some pretty cool things. It has some pretty mind-bending story twists. It also has um, some really cool um, uh, no-gravity moments where you're out in a space suit kind of flying around uh, the station and those are, uh, you know, like it's got a very muffled sound. So it kind of reminds me a little bit of, um, the dead space sequences were probably done a little bit better just because you have a bit more free flowing, um, space and yeah, you can even fight enemies out there, which is also really scary. So there's a lot of great things. And I think that I think people are a bit hypercritical of the game for some reason. Possibly because it's called Prey and has nothing to do with the original play, Prey game from a decade before. And also the uh, fact that it was it essentially replaced a an anticipated sequel to Prey, which also had nothing to do with the original pretty much. So it was a sequel to a game that didn't wasn't really connected to it, and it was also a replacement of a sequel to a game that it had nothing really to do with. So I think the brand actually probably hurt it more than it should have. If it was called... Uh, I don't know, <laughs> Space Shock, I don't know, something like something else, it probably would have gotten a better reception. But I think people are kind of bummed because uh, a lot of marketing material had gone out to Prey 2, essentially, that never happened. And from what I heard, Prey 2, I don't know if it would have been better than this, but it would have been um, interesting, and it's too bad that that got canceled. So, Yeah, Neuroshock, I actually like that. I don't know if they got sued by EA for that, but I, I would have dug Neuroshock. That would have been awesome. I mean, they got away with Bioshock. Uh, 2K got away with Bioshock, so Neuroshock would have been fine, I think. Yeah, you, why don't you market it? I also remember um, one of the problems I had with the marketing. Um, I I could I tried to find a trailer uh, that did this. I think some of the most of the public trailers um, were better, but I remember seeing a trailer for this game, and it had a it was completely wrong for the game. It uh it was like kind of making a, a goofy meme -y thing where you could turn into items. It was like almost like a gag reel. And I'm like, this game is not the game you advertise with the gag reel. I'm sorry. I remember seeing that at PAX and, and I, I think that mismarketing was probably a factor too, because the game has a lot, a lot of really great details into it. And I don't see, I could see if you attracted the Bioshock crowd, people would have really dug this, but for some reason they couldn't. So I don't know. It's weird. Um, I was talking about the Prey 2 that was canceled and, um, this game was either rebranded. I'm wondering, I actually had to look into that because this game was probably in production while Prey 2 was being made. So maybe it was rebranded. I don't know. Some sort of marketing shenanigans ha happened and I think that probably hurt the game. So. Alrighty.
So here we got some uh, some Doom. Um, like I said, I, I'm not including Doom Eternal on this list because it's too new. I think I might be uh, I might be uh, too biased for that for a couple years, so maybe down the road it might be added to this list. But in the meantime, Doom 2016 fits within the rules I specified. Still an incredible game. Um, surprisingly, like it was such a shock that it was nearly as good as it was. I remember uh, leading up to this, people were kind of speculative. Like the the reveal trailer was kind of cool, but we've been hearing about a Doom sequel for years. Uh, an entire Doom uh, four was already canceled, completely scrapped, canceled, and then reborn. But if you look on the internet, not only was this game not a downgrade from the original trailer, you could argue that um, if you watch the uh, uh, Crobe Cat video, where it compares the Doom trailer to this, you could argue it was actually improved since the E3 trailer, which is a rarity. Um, game looked great, uh, ran pretty well, but then when they patched it with Vulcan support, it ran even better. Extremely smooth, fast-paced gameplay. It was uh, uh, probably the fastest Doom since the original two games, which is great. Um, I think that Doom 3, although it's, it was a fine uh, semi-horror shooter heavily inspired by games like, you know, Half-Life. Doom 2016 definitely took the spirit of the original games and reinterpreted it to a modern uh, gameplay style and then made the brilliant decision to add uh, Melee as a practically uh, mandatory gameplay part of the gameplay loop where you have to like punch and do glory kills to get more uh ammo and and more life that game made the game really frenetic you couldn't just like hide in the back and like shoot a couple things and hide behind cover or whatever you had to be really aggressive you had to be really fast and and uh mixed with the incredible soundtrack it just made it a an insane fever dream of of violence basically and i think that's what made the game stand out so much uh and, and not only that, but it was just made for memes, like the rip and tear meme just like took off. Um, and, you know, they added minor, minor elements, like the, the idea of progression, where you're upgrading your weapons, your different weapon modes. You know, it's, it's pretty basic. And by the end, you'll pretty much have everything anyway. But the semblance of choice definitely added or, uh, to the game loop and let you kind of tweak your, your play style a bit. And even if you have everything unlocked, you still have to set which, um, upgrade you're using for each weapon. So it not only kind of took, brought back classic weapons, but kind of reinterpreted them, added them to them and added layers and mechanics onto it. Whereas, you know, instead of just using your shotgun, your shotgun plus a grenade launcher, you know, you got your uh, minigun plus a mobile turret, you know, you've got your rockets plus a uh, guided rocket launcher, which is almost reminding me a bit of Unreal Tournament, which I love. So, um, yeah, I know uh, it takes a lot of inspiration, a lot of different things. I'd also argue that it probably took inspiration from Brutal Doom or the uh, Doom mods that had gotten really popular by that time. Um, you can definitely see some of that kind of Doom Plus sort of uh, attitude and, and ideas from there. So I think that it really went back to its roots, took a lot of good new ideas, mixed them in there. You know, may not have gotten it 100%, but got it like a good 95 98% right and made an incredible visceral experience that was both in, in very fun, very challenging at times, and felt like a huge breath of fresh air compared to the endless drudge of samey military shooters we've been getting for like the past 10 years, um, ever since, you know, Call of Duty Modern Warfare came out basically, um, or even before that even with like the Medal of Honor games and whatnot. So yeah, no, uh, Doom 2016 was such a huge uh, like F yeah to the uh, to the first person shooter where they could show that you could take these frenetic quake slash doom like uh, mechanics and make them popular and focus on single player again. Like there was a decent, a fairly decent multiplayer mode. I, I tried it. It was all right. It was made by, I guess, some former Halo devs. So I, there was actually some unique weapons just for the multiplayer mode that reminded me of like Reach and some other Halo games. But really it was the single player that stood out. And, uh, it showed people that people like the frenetic, um, fast paced sort of semi arena shooter gameplay, um, with a single player focus. And that was still sellable. Uh, whereas we've been told again and again that, you know, 
multiplayer only shooters make it like call of duty that's the only way and this showed the exact opposite was true and not only true but completely um uh potentially successful so it was not only a really extremely fun game i couldn't really put down until i was done um but also a uh great um punch back against a really gr uh really unfortunate trend that had been hitting the the shooter industry for a while And glory kills are awesome. Glory kills are amazing. <laughs> Definitely not one of my favorite shooters. I, I still, even watching this gameplay, I like feel like uh, booting up the game again and just running through an arcade mode and just ripping and tearing and throwing guy, guys apart and everything. It's all right. Uh, cool. So that was Doom. And speaking of Unreal Tournament... Uh, Unreal Tournament 2004, also known as Unreal UT, uh, UT 2K4. Um, this game was actually just an enhanced version of Unreal Tournament 2003 with some more maps, more modes, more everything. This game, if you were able to get it like uh, in stores for like 20, 30 bucks, is probably the best uh, bang for your buck you could get from any game pretty much, especially if you had friends on PC. This game had no DRM, no disk requirements. So you could install it on one machine, install another machine, another machine, and you can get a LAN party done in like an hour, all ready to play, basically. And uh, yeah, that just made it an incredible, and it was just a, a huge, va uh, great value um, because there were, I think, like a half a dozen to like eight or to 10 modes or whatever, and dozens and dozens of maps, um, lots of customization, lots of modifiers, even without getting into the mod modding scene, just the built-in features of the game were just immense. You could turn on low gravity, uh, high jump, instagib, make crazy unique modes, customize everything. It was just a huge sandbox, shooter sandbox. And you could play it kind of traditional uh, sort of death matches, um, uh, last man standing or team death match. But what I really liked was um, Onslaught and Assault. Onslaught was basically almost like a domination style game where you take over certain points and you, once you get to the, uh, but it has a, a unique, uh, aspect in that you get to the, you capture points and they're connected by nodes and certain points are optional, but they have like a special vehicle or a special bonus that you'll get from the, owning that node. Um, I don't remember if this is this game or the later Unreal tournament games, but certain nodes would actually cause like an effect that would affect the map. I think that, it was either this game or UT3 that had Avalanche, where you could actually control a node that would avalanche the other side of the of the map or something like that. That might have been UT3, so I might be jumping ahead for that. But um, you could have these huge, gigantic uh, battlefields with tons of players and vehicles. They had uh, airships, um, you know, kind of buggies. It was basically Halo on crack, essentially. That's what I kind of thought of it as, is like Halo on crack, where you've got you just like plow over guys with like speeders or you get these like big tanks with multiple people in them firing away and uh you know while their airships around shooting it everything like that so I, I i always really appreciated that yeah i think they're there right now he's trying to take over a node right now and if you look at the map up there um uh, you, you can you can connect to other nodes and once you connect to the enemy enemy uh uh base you can then take out their base and then win and there's some crazy cool uh, ways you can do that. You can even like suicide mission your uh, vehicle into their core and destroy it. A lot of really, really fun, crazy, wild stuff. Like it was less about getting like these, you know, really tight, tightly knit uh, mechanics and more just about go hog wild. However you win, you win basically. Um, and there's also the assault mode, which was kind of like a um, almost like rush in the later battlefield games. Uh, but their stages were just kind of wild. Like one of the, one of the most memorable on, um, assault maps in unreal, uh, tournament was you start out and one side are manning turrets on a spaceship, like a big, uh, like space destroyer. And the other guys are in freaking, uh, space fighters and with star Wars it starts out like star Wars where the space fighters actually have to attack this, the ship, take out the turrets 
dodge enemy laser fire and all kind of stuff while the other other guys are trying to fend their uh, their main uh, mothership off with, <clears throat> by the enemy. <clears throat> and um, once the fighters complete enough objectives, then they get to the um, the hangar, then they enter first-person shooter mode, and then the, it revolves back into the first-person shooter mode thing where you're, you're attacking on foot again. A lot of really crazy ideas, like, uh, epic back in the day they just went hog wild and like hey let's add this let's add this and yeah Unreal tournament uh, 2004 was easily one of the most fun uh value uh high value packages of sh uh multiplayer shooter gameplay you could ever uh hope to play and what's great is that every mode was completely bought uh bot friendly so you could even if you had no friends you could just play bot matches and just crank up the difficulty and unlike uh, some games, the bots uh, actually scale up really well. Like you can actually uh, crank the bots up to the maximum uh, difficulty level and they'll wreck you. They'll like destroy you. They have really, really good aim. So, you know, really Im impressive overall. I don't know how they did half of the things that they got done in that game, but it's probably, you know, if I had to pick one game package that'll have you playing for hours and hours and hours, with or without a ton of friends, I'd say Animal Tournament uh, 2K4 is one of the best, for sure. And if you had no friends... <laughs> hey, I, I grew up uh, without a, a ton of friends to play with uh, land, so it was, a, it was a, you know, talking about myself as well, so. Yeah, yeah, back when Tim Sweeney and... Um, I, I I don't know how involved uh, uh, Cliff Blazinski was at the time. That's just a tiny little tank. <laughs> It's so small. Badger turret. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, and, and not only that, but if you want got into the modding scene, there was in some insane mods for this game. I remember there was this one mod that I installed for Unreal Tournament uh, that transformed the game into an epic uh, fantasy medieval uh, siege game where you actually could man catapults. Um, there were different classes. One class that had like this sword whip that was like a, a, a links of swords. You can like swipe it around like a kind of like that one character from Soul Calibur. I forget his name. Or maybe it was Ivy. I'm trying to remember. Um, and there was, you could ride dragons. Like it was a crazy mod. There were some uh, sports kind of game mods. There were mods that would replace all the guns. Like if you could, you know, you some of the guns in Unreal Tournament were a little bit difficult to learn. Uh, I was always a flat cannon type guy, flat cannon and rockets. Um, but uh, some people got really, really, really good at this one rifle, which you have to shoot out. It's really difficult because you have to shoot out a a sphere, a slow moving sphere, and then shoot that sphere with a with a, um, a hit scan weapon. So you shoot out a slow projectile and then shoot that projectile with your hit scan weapon. If you did that, it would make an explosion that did a lot of damage. But um, getting that to happen was always a, a bit of a pain. So the default weapons aren't weren't all amazing, um, but they'd had some uses. Like for example, the link gun there uh, does either burst fire or like a array of damage. But at, if you noticed, um, if you shoot the link gun at vehicles or nodes, it would either repair vehicles like that, or it, it would take over nodes. So. Weapons also had utility as well. So it was really, really clever. I'd like to see... I, I liked Unreal Tournament 3, but I could definitely see how it's just kind of uh, basic ugliness and Gears of War-esque uh, aesthetic minus enough of a, a fan base kind of killed the franchise uh, for a bit. And Fortnite killed Unreal Tournament 4, which was really, really bad, and I hate it for that. But um, yeah, for what it's worth, I, I would just take like a pretty much a one-for-one remake uh, remaster of uh utk4 or U ut2k4 uh in a heartbeat so yeah you know if you take a yeah like if you some of the original unreal tournament maps like uh, i think facing worlds if you do that at low gravity um that was always one of my favorite maps to just jump up 50 feet in the air and fly over and you see space rotating around you so yeah uh ut Unreal Tournament 2004 was definitely a, a good one. One for the uh, one for the books. 
Moving on. Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, to people who had a PlayStation back in the day, this was um, a really surprising game. Um, it, I think it was headed by the guy who did uh, lead designer for Ogre Battle and Tactics Ogre. It was um, one of the first big uh, mainstream forays into um, strategy uh, RPGs. So it took the kind of fairly fairly basic Final Fantasy approach, but made it turn it into like almost a war game, like a tabletop war game. Like this was more uh, comparable to something like Warhammer um, than it was to something like Final Fantasy, where you actually have to plan out tactics. You have movement speed, uh, elevation, uh, trajectory, uh, ranges, ver uh, various classes. Um, but it was all just packaged together so well and so charmingly. Like the um, every character just had that kind of Final Fantasy, or that 16-bit, 32-bit Final Fantasy charm. You know, everybody was in uh, kind of isometric 2D sprites. So they looked really kind of clear and and had that sort of uh, cuteness to them, kind of scrunched up uh, super deformed cuteness to them. But it also had like a 3D map that you could rotate and look around. So it was both uh, pretty functional, but also very charming and, and had that kind of, it's like a nice melding of like the modern and the classic. Um, but what probably really made this, the two things that really made this game stand out exceptionally were, were the uh, really almost like a, a Shakespearean style uh, level or a Game of Thronesian sort of um, level of the storytelling where there's like intrigue and backstabbing and kingdoms fighting against kingdoms. And we'd gotten we had gotten like betrayals and the sense of kingdoms before in final fantasy games, but nothing to this level. Like this felt like there were big players in the world actively fighting over, uh, Ivalis or Ivalis or whatever you say. Uh, it, it, it had a real sense of, of, uh, a world beyond your actions, so to speak. Like people would be conquered out and you'd hear about it and you weren't really sure what was going on over there, but it must've been bad. Um, combined with uh, fairly cin cinematic and really well-written characters. Um, I remember distinctly one scene where you, uh, you see someone talking to somebody else and you get the idea that he's about to like betray or kill him. But instead of seeing a little pixely guy go like and stab him, you, uh, you, you see him walk up to him and the camera pans up and you hear like a, and just like the kind of a cinematic way of doing it. And I just, Reminds me a little bit of um, how I think uh, Hitchcock did something like that at one point in one of his movies, and it's a really interesting way of uh, of doing it. Um, yeah, Final Fantasy Tactics is pretty grindy, fairly grindy, but the grind was actually really enjoyable because of the uh, the next thing I was going to say about the game was the job system. I think that some of the Japanese only uh, Final Fantasy games that we didn't get to play until much later, like I think it was Final Fantasy actual Final Fantasy 3 or Final Fantasy 5 had a job system, but those games didn't really get released to the U.S. until later in some kind of compilation discs in, uh, in English. But um, So this was kind of our first introduction to what was becoming a somewhat of a staple in the Final Fantasy universe, which was the job system, where you start out with two classes, and as you level up with those, you can then unlock more classes, and, and each character, once they have a high enough cla uh, level in this class and this class and they unlock more classes that are like hybrids of the of each other so you might start out with just like a, a chemist and a squire um you know basic fighter basic healer eventually you can get light mages and dark mages and and dragoons who can leap up in the air and and land uh and do crazy damage you can get archers you can get um summoners you can get all sorts of crazy stuff and it was just the extreme variety of, of jobs and uh, different ways you could develop each character, which really made it interesting. And not only that, but you could even grab um, abilities from your primary job and abilities from another job that you've, you've previously trained in and combine them. So not only are there a ton of different jobs, but you can actually hybridize jobs basically by taking ability from the primary, from one job and ability from another job and adding those both to your character or grabbing 
a passive ability from another job and adding it. So you can essentially almost hybridize like three, like four or five different jobs at a time. And so you can with, and some jobs had like 50 or more abilities. So with that, you can really, really customize your character and make it uh, incredibly, um, each, each one of your party incredibly unique. Um, but it was tough at times. Like sometimes you would just get completely pounded and, and you wouldn't really uh, see it coming. I actually played uh, the, this mod, which made it actually harder, but somewhat more balanced, I guess. And yeah, I got killed in the second battle like a couple times. So yeah, no, it was definitely a lot more like a old school D&D where you could like, you know, cross multi-class and uh, yeah, essentially cross class and stuff like that. Really, really interesting uh, system that hadn't quite been replicated in any other game that I know of. I know that they made some uh, Final Fantasy Tactics advanced games. Um, there was a uh, Final Fantasy Tactics 2 in development for the con for the home consoles, but um, I actually saw some screenshots and some early gameplay prototypes of it, but it didn't get past the uh, early prototype stage, I guess. I don't know why they got shot down, but it's too bad. Oh, another cool thing is you can actually charm um, almost any monster in the game and actually bring them into your party. It's like those little bomb guys. You can actually charm them uh, and bring them into your party. You can charm chocobos. There's like three different types of chocobos you can charm. And you can actually ride your chocobos too. So you can actually bring a chocobo into battle, then ride the chocobo and, and move around with them. Super cool. Very interesting. Definitely one of my favorite uh, favorite uh, RPGs on the on the PlayStation era. So this game <laughs> is definitely not a perfect game, but it was uh, one of, I wouldn't say it's an ambitious game, but I love what it, it tried to do. And I still find myself going back to replay it every once in a while. This game had a really weird art style, Time Commando, by the way. This game had a really weird art style. Um, uh, it actually, they actually rendered a fly through of each level. Um, and so when you progress through level, it wasn't actually rendering polygons. It was basically just playing the next frames of a, of a pre-rendered video. And so as you'll see, it's kind of like moving the video forward a little bit, then it'll stop and then move the video forward a little bit, then it'll stop and move the video forward a bit and it'll stop. Um, basically this game is one of the few games that lets you go all the way from prehistoric, like literally, literally kicking saber tooth tigers in the face, um, to, shooting uh laser guns at robots like it has the whole spectrum i forget exactly how many eras there are but every level has its own unique um weapons it has its own unique enemies it has its own uh unique look and feel to it um from the ones i recall there's prehistoric there's like um like the roman empire uh there's a um Medieval Europe, Medieval Japan, uh, Conquistadors, uh, early World Wars, like World War One, World War Two, Modern Wars. Uh, I'm probably missing a couple other ones here and there. Um, then, you know, obviously future and then eventually you're like out of time or whatever. But I, I think that I think I missed like a two or two or three other ones. Oh, yeah. Wild West and a couple others. But yeah, there's like a ton of different levels and they all feel really different. I'd say um, earlier ones are a little bit of a slog, but as you get it, like this level is the um, European uh, on the screen here is the European uh, Middle Ages. I think that's right when the game gets really fun. When you start getting the swords and and uh, axes and, and medieval weaponry like that, you start to feel a, little, a lot more powerful. But by the time you get like uh, the pistols and, and um, long range weapons like that in the... Uh, Conquistador, especially the cowboy level that can get the cowboy level is like probably one of my favorites just because it's, it just, you get so many guns and so many bullets and you can just like shoot guys out of barns and, you know, off of cliffs and things like that. Yeah. Time commando. Uh, not many people really talk about this game anymore. Um, but it, it was really a, uh, I think it was made by Adeline software, the, um, Adeline or Delphi Delphine software, uh, which, are best known probably for the flashback games. Um, 
this is a definitely a different uh different type of game for them but yeah it has if you compare it to to fade to black and flashback you can kind of see a little bit of similarity in the animation and and model style but yeah no i, I had a, a ton of fun with um the te uh, ten commando games and despite their jankiness and they're and they're extremely linear like they have a couple little si hidden secrets on the side but because you're basically playing in a a video that's pausing every once in a while <laughs> of course that's going to be pretty linear but it's kind of like a um at its core it's almost like a double dragon type game with a very interesting shell around it but i love the fact that you're kind of going through the different time periods and punching bears in the prehistoria you know stabbing uh julius caesar or whatever in the roman times uh shooting crossbows through the face of you know monks and things like that in the middle ages and uh you know shoot uh throwing dynamite at cowboys and things like that just a lot of fun yeah i hate saying delphine anymore just because of that but i want to do a um delphine and adeline uh retrospective at some point but that'll probably be in the future all right so yeah time commando definitely worth a look i think it's on gog so worth checking out it was an early windows 95 game so it actually runs okay surprisingly a lot of those early windows 95 games that are had a rough time but uh yeah this one this one did all right Um, let's see, I've already done these. All right, next up. Cool. So, Castlevania Symphony Night. Uh, this game uh, is, I, don't know, I wouldn't even say it's like, it's probably within the first 10 Castlevania games, but there'd already been quite a few by, the, by then. But they'd all been uh, traditionally side-scroller action games. You fall into pits, you die, you have a certain amount of lives. Um, you get through with level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4, you know, all the way to the last level. You defeat Dracula or whomever and you win. Um, the previous, uh, the second game, Simon's Quest, kind of experimented with that. Um, it still had a lot of the same issues, but it was a bit more open world. I mean, people liked that one, so they kind of toned it back, but Symphony of the Night, uh, uh, Iga, um, as he's better, best known, the designer, basically said, let's go RPG with this thing. Let's go fully open. Let's do Metroid with this. And this game is what puts the... Uh, Vania in the Metroidvania title. Uh, this is the game that established Castlevania as a Metroid-like type of game and uh, may have actually been more influential, weirdly enough, to the Metroidvania uh, sort of uh, genre than Metroid itself, which is weird because this game borrows a lot from Metroid. If you look at the map, it looks exactly like Super Metroid. But um, I absolutely adored this game. Um, I got it at, a, I think, at 15 bucks at, at a what would be later a, a game, a game stop or a, yeah, but, uh, it was probably the best, uh, money I'd ever spent on a used, uh, PlayStation game. And I had no idea just how much fun I'd get out of it. Like it, it because it's more open world, because there's a huge environment, you get to revisit areas. You would get to unlock more areas as you get more abilities. Um, you start out, uh, you start out powerful, but then you like lose all your abilities early on, you know, as part of the story. But as you gain more and more abilities, you can get into wolf form, you can become mist form, you can go into bat form and double jump, you know, all these other extra abilities that allow you to get to more areas, uh, different keys and whatnot. And the map is quite huge to begin with, but, you know, semi-spoiler alert, there's a reverse castle. So I thought I was done with the game after like 20 or so hours in the main castle. And I, I, I completed the game, quote unquote, uh, until a friend came along and said, hey, have you gotten a second castle yet? And I'm like, what second castle? What are you talking about? Come to find out I'd missed a secret that led to two other entire areas in the in the castle. 
and to a, an alternative ending, which unlocked the second half of the game. <laughs> that blew my freaking mind when I realized that I had, I wasn't even halfway done with the game, which uh, realized just how much content, how many items and, and monsters you could fight, how many bosses, uh, how many uh, spell-like abilities and things like that you could get. Uh, just an incredibly customizable game. Like every even obvious uh, abilities you'd never think to turn off. Every single like special power up you got, where like you gained another jump or another ability, you can actually go into your character and turn everything on and off. So if you wanted to turn off your double jump, you could, for example. Which, like why would you? But hey, why not? Right. Um, you had a full inventory. You could gain new abilities, new weapons. You could actually equip left and right hand. So you could actually equip like a dagger or a sword and a shield or like a, uh, a one-handed sword and a dagger or whatever, one on each hand. You could go in and, and eat apples and fruits and things like that. So it got, it got really, really, uh, really borrowed a lot of uh, RPG elements that um, from other games. But I found it made, uh, it definitely was one of the more easy uh, <laughs> It was easier than most of the other Castlevania games because you could actually grind and level up and, and kind of buff yourself up. But I found it really enthralling just because of the environmental design, the interesting new character. You play literally the son of Dracula who's got, you know, he's like a dampier or whatever, and he's got various cool powers, you know, rather than just being another another Belmont. Um, but also had a really interesting story. And, I, and when I say there's not much story to this game, there's like maybe five to 10 lines or dialogue sequences in the game. But uh, what it does tap into is really fascinating. It kind of, it, it tells the adventure through the gameplay. So it's like 99% gameplay, 1% story basically. But when it does tap into the story elements, it's really cool. And very few games have done this. This game actually begins at the very tail end of um, uh, Akimaju uh, Dracula X. Or um, uh, Rondo of Blood, I should say. That's the American uh, version, I think. Um, you actually play through the last segment of uh, Rondo of Blood as Richter Belmont and defeat Dracula at the very beginning of the game. And it feels like the ending of a real game. Like it feels like a, like a legit ending of a, of a Castlevania game. But they did that so that it could tie that storyline into Alucard's storyline, which was set years later. So... The one-two punch of uh, Rondo of Blood and S Castlevania Symphony of the Night is a really interesting through line. And although there's not a whole lot of story, the the turn of events in those two type games and how tightly connected they are uh, is really fascinating. And and uh, I can only think of a couple of the games that really tap into that as as much. I, I'd say Super Metroid is actually another game that does that, where it 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 doesn't have a whole lot of story, but it connects to its prequel very interestingly. So. <laughs> yeah five to ten lines are really memorable because of the voice acting is like what is a man a miserable pile of secrets but enough talk have at you yeah every single enemy in the game has its own encyclopedia entry with its own stats its own experience gain its own uh rare loot items and stuff just an incredibly uh it's just a huge expansion to the castlevania series and Although there's been a few more, um, more kind of classic Castlevania games since then, it almost took the entire direction of the Castlevania to uh, side scroller franchise to that direction. Like it made the Castle the Metroidvania series now Castlevania now into a Metroidvania series, which was an interesting development. Um, also, some really good games in the uh, Game Boy Advance and uh, DS library, but I think that I felt they're all a little a little less interesting than Symphony of the Night. I don't know. A couple of them are pretty cool, but yeah. Um, I heard that the Japanese uh, voice acting was definitely more, uh, you could take it more seriously than the English voice acting, but I actually liked the English voice acting of the <laughs> Symphony of the Night series. I thought it was, it was pretty great. I was kind of weirded out actually when I, when I replayed it, uh, the PSP version, because they changed all the actors and and the did new voiceover and I was like, whoa, this is this is different. All right, next up. Uh relevant, uh Super Metroid. Um coming at ninety four. 
this I didn't know it at the time, but this was the third game in the in the Metroid series um, after the original for the NES, which I had played, and the Return of Samus for the Game Boy, which I hadn't. Game Boy had uh, it does some interesting things for the the, the Game Boy uh, version. And I kind of wish I had played it because it taps into that a little bit in the story of Super Metroid. But um, on its own, you can even just play this is your first game and you're still com- going to be completely enthralled. Had a, one of the moodiest intros of any 16-bit game, possibly the moodiest intro of any 16-bit game I'd ever played. Really uh, stark, memorable soundtrack. Even he was like sepia for, you know, showing, uh, reenacting the events of the first game in the past. Incredible art style, um, incredible uh, pixel art. Uh, really, really, really uh, just absolute mind uh, brain worms of a soundtrack. And, um, you know, it, it, it goes over, luckily it actually goes over the events of the first two games where you take out the space pirate queen uh, mother brain in the first game. And then the second game, you actually go to the Metroid uh, homeworld. And after defeating like the Metroid queen, essentially um, you find a hatchling that is uh, that kind of imprints on you and it doesn't attack you. It thinks it's your, your it's mother. You take the hatchling to a base and that's where like the events of super Metroid take on. And, uh, Quickly, you find out that um, the base where you entrusted the the care of this new Metroid is, is under attack, and it was freaking dark, man. Like you go in there, and the entire place is completely destroyed. You see corpses everywhere, and there's like almost no music. It's just atmospheric noise. You just hear the hums of machines. Uh, the first like ten to fifteen minutes of Super Metroid are some of the most. Uh, entrancing atmospheric uh, moments I've ever played in a game. It's just really good. And you may laugh at that because it's a 16-bit game with pixels, but they really nailed that experience early in the game. It opens up and gets a bit more upbeat and a bit less atmospheric later on, but still, even when you go to places like uh, um, Norfair and things like that, you get that kind of really the sense of just like a, a thickness to the to the environments. Um, they use a lot of really kind of uh, cutting edge stuff in through the Super Metroid, for example. They use a sort of like atmospheric haze there. You can tell um, they've got a gradient from like the, going from the blue to the top. It has just a little bit of a, uh, a nice effect to it. And later on, uh, you'll actually see that when the ship is exploding, uh, you can see the actual screen tilt. And so you're actually jumping sideways to try to get back onto it. They actually use, I think, Mode 7 or whatever to tilt the screen the actual gameplay uh, graphics so that you actually weren't even up- upright anymore. Like they did a lot of really great uh, cutting edge um, techniques to make this game as interesting as it was. They do a couple like a uh, um, uh, twists. This person, I think is, uh, I think this recording is trying to speed run it. So they're just getting hit by Ridley, but um, yeah, Brent Sarthi music is amazing. Uh, still listen to the remixes and even the original music to this day. Just an overall list, a- absolute masterclass uh, from an artistic standpoint and really expands the original's uh, gameplay in every respect. The The artwork is really like high def and really um, characters are bigger and things like that, but it, they found the, just the right uh, perspective. A lot of the Super Nintendo games at the time would make their sprites and their environments a little bit too big and so you could barely see where you were going. This is like just the right per, uh, proportion to the screen where you actually had just, uh, you could see a lot of, you got a lot of environmental uh, space around you, but you could definitely see all the expressiveness and all the characters and all the details. Yeah, look at the screen there, it's actually tilting and it really kind of trips you up and freaks you out. And first time you see it, um, all it's doing is basically, I think, using the Super Nintendo Mode 7 and just tilting the graphics, but it was an incredibly effective uh, uh, technique at the time. Um, but yeah, no, it's a it's a really amazing game. Uh, opens up like the the just the very stark and and somber opening just gets it opens up and as you creep into uh, Planet Zeebs more, it becomes alive and you know monsters that. Uh, used to be, you know, sleeping or dead or whatever, awaken. And yeah, no, it's, it's just a, a an, an amazing uh, 
firsthand exploration of like a desolate world. And it was a huge, like if you play this several years after playing the original, it was a huge nostalgia hit um, because you didn't recognize a lot of, like you'd literally crawl down into the, uh, the old space pirate slash mother brain uh, base that you destroyed in the first game. So even back then, uh, this the department of Nintendo know how to do nostalgia, but instead of just cashing in on characters and you know stuff like that, they actually really like this is the this is the a semblance semblance of the abandoned base from the original Metroid. The original Metroid actually had that that climb was much 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 higher and had much smaller platforms, but it was similar enough that you got what it was supposed to be, and so they really kind of. This is probably one of the first games that kind of revered its its predecessor to this degree. It really had you uh, kind of like get into the zone and and feel the kind of desolate remains of of previous um, games. So yeah, no, Metric still holds a still holds a um, a really uh, big place in my heart. And um, yeah, this is definitely one of the best uh, best uh, games of this generation, hands down. Yeah, I, I always called it um, Zebbies or or uh, Zebies or whatever, but I think it's supposed to be Zebes, kind of like Thebes. I don't know how you say it. I I've changed how many so many things I've pronounced because back in the day you'd read the things and you had no idea how to say them. There wasn't any voice acting in in Super Metroid, so you you just said it how how it was written, however you thought it might have been said. But yeah, no, I know some people can beat this game in like an hour, but. I'm not one of those people who can beat Super Metroid an hour. All right, next up. I don't realize how much talking I do and how how it hits my throat quite as much when I'm doing it solo, but all good. All right, um, System Shock 2 is the sequel to System Shock 1, which is actually released the same year as uh, Super Metroid, but... Uh, I didn't get into System Shock 1 at the time. I got into it later. Um, I had played System Shock 2 first, which uh, was one of the last games that Looking Glass Studios made. It was a co-production between Looking Glass Studios and Irrational Games. And if you've not played System Shock 2, you're in for a treat if you can get, if you can get uh, through the somewhat dated graphics. It's actually aged quite well for a 1999 game. Um, the environments are very clean. This is actually raw gameplay. This is nothing special. It's just um, straight up un unmodded gameplay. But uh, you're basically a cyber hacker, uh, cyber hacker, sneaker warrior <laughs> uh, aboard a spaceship, something like 16 million uh, light years away from Earth in super deep space. And you're having to battle with uh, rogue AIs uh, with uh, monstrous mutants. Uh, the entire, most of the entire crew is dead, and you're just trying to stay alive. Uh, and it's probably I I I kind of prefer Deus Ex, but as an immersive sim, it's got to be one of the best immersive sims ever designed. It's just such a clean, clear concept, and it has uh, just a a really <laughs> a tense and surreal uh, feeling of dread and solitude that very few other games have. You just feel like you're the one of the last sentient things alive on the, on, in this distant uh, horrific nightmare in, in deep space. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a really incredible um, artistic vision. I mean, um, it was using a dated engine at the time. It was using the Thief engine, which is already a couple of years out of date, and it wasn't as groundbreaking even at the time. But uh, it actually holds up really well due to the clean art style. Like uh, there's a lot of like simple tiles and geometric shapes, rather than getting really into like details and and um, uh, lots of high high density textures. But uh, is the finest skip System Shock 1 and System Shock 2. Um, you'd probably get some more references, and there's one moment you'd probably appreciate more if you played System Shock 1. Um, but honestly, I played System Shock 2 first and loved it. 
So I think it's fine. It does do an introductory sequence, uh, assuming that you may not have played the first game. Um, it'd be cool. You'd you'd get you'd probably get more reverence for the series if you played both. But honestly, the first one's a bit dated. It's a bit, it's pretty hard to get into. So if you had to play one, I definitely say play uh, System Shock Two. Um, one of the major changes it makes over the original. The original was pretty much uh, more or less your character was just what you had collected. Where System Shock Two adds more RPG progression. You can actually build. You can actually start with one of three classes. There's like a fighter class, which is really good with guns, maintenance, and repair. Um, there's a a more hacker class who can use tools and um, can basically bypass um, ice and uh, and electronic security measures. Uh, and then there's more of a um, uh, psionic class who can actually use like their mental powers using a psi uh, amplifier. So it brings a lot more versatility and variety into your your gameplay. Um, and you can also choose to be more stealthy or less stealthy. Uh, I always kind of like playing a sort of a, a hacker, hacker stealth hybrid. Cause I always find that a super interesting play style where you're sneaking around, um, taking guys out secretly while hacking security, uh, cameras and security turrets and things like that to do your bidding. That's always been a really attractive play style to me. And it still is probably one of the best cyberpunk themed games out there in terms of just uh sure versatility and interactivity like thief before it and deus ex after it system shock 2 just has a uh just a ton of de of environmental uh objects and interactions like almost everything can either be broken picked up thrown or drank or eaten or used in some way um there's a lot of like beer and drinks and, and food stuffs just lying around. You can like eat or drink for, um, for health or psi power. Like I think, uh, if I think if I'm rem remembering correctly, I think like, like drinking some orange juice would give you, uh, extra life, but, uh, smoking a pack of cigarettes would give you extra psi at the cost of life or things something like that. Yeah. I hate the psi monkeys. <laughs> I absolutely just despise those psi monkeys for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's environmental stuff, there's uh, radiation, things like that. Uh, you can also get, you know, various suits and equipment. You can equip different types of armor. You can actually have powered mods. We actually have to insert into one or two slots and then enable them and they actually consume, um, power. And then they have to be recharged at a recharge station. Uh, there's even guns. I think they get need, need to get recharged. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, just so many different aspects of the game. Uh, a lot of different skills. There's even perks and stuff that you can get at different uh, parts of the game, and you gain. Uh, you don't gain experience for killing, but you you gain cybernetic modules as you complete objectives throughout the game. So there's actually a finite amount of cybernetic modules. So you cannot actually build. You can't just grind and build up your character to be like be a god. You actually have to make a, a choice throughout your progression of the game, and it'll take a while to actually get to where you want to go um especially psi psi players uh actually have have a really rough time early on but later on they get some really powerful abilities um the easiest and most kind of obvious way to play would be like a soldier but the soldiers um kind of miss out on the more interesting things like I don't, you can't really tell here in the it's being cropped off but i'm like hacking into a, a box and i just hacked it open and and now i'm able to get the contents inside um, you can pick up weapons, unload them, um, mod them. Uh, weapons also have um, uh, durability. And so there's actually a maintenance skill, which keeps a, a weapon uh, in good health uh, using resources and maintenance tools, I think. But there's also a repair skill. So when, when a tool, when a weapon is broken, you can't maintain it anymore. You have to repair it. So they have two different repair skills. <laughs> And uh, certain things need to be like certain weapons can only be used by people with skill, a certain skill or higher, and certain things can only be repaired by a certain uh, level of skill, maintenance or repair or higher. So every single aspect of the game has like tons of skills and perks and other me mechanics built around it. Uh, much more complicated, much more uh, in depth than the, the original game, and um, not to mention it just has a fantastic story. Uh, you're really just kind of like biting your fingernails, looking around each each quarter, 
uh, can get terrifying at times, especially in 1999. But um, even today, I still get scared. Like I think I was frightened on live stream the other day where a couple uh, for a few weeks, a month ago or whatever, where I turned around a corner and a, and a, a guy was right there about to hit, knock me over the head with a wrench. And it was terrifying. Or, you know, you, you just hear these like creepy robot voices talking amongst themselves where they're like, they're service robots. So they're still saying like service oriented things like, you know, you know, always make sure you're watching about your health or whatever, but in a weird, creepy, like, um, malignant way where they're, you're, there's something off with the robot. They're either glitching out or they're, uh, taken over by the rogue AI or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. This, the feeling of loneliness and solitude was almost unheard of or uh, almost unparalleled in, in this game. And, uh, even though there are, you do read the remnants uh, or logs and stuff left by other humans. It almost makes you feel for alone, more alone because you know that these people are all probably dead. <laughs> but yeah, no, and and Shodan, which is one of the main villains in this game, or is just easily one of the top five villains in gaming. Just an incredible, uh, uh, creepy uh, voice and a malignant uh, threat, but is also like your ally as well at one point. So it's a, it's a really interesting, uh, really interesting, um, plays with the players, uh, expectations and loyalties. And, uh, although the story is fairly linear, the way you actually get through, uh, the Rickenbacker and the, um, I forget both the names of the ships right now, but you know, get through the, both the ships and the various areas you get through. Um, it's totally up to you. There's a lot of different ways you can break the windows, you can go through vents, you can go through back doors, you can hack, you can, you can, uh, brute force, you can do all this other stuff. So yeah, it's, it's got a lot going for it and it's still one of my favorite games of all time, uh, hands down. All right, next up, uh, it's going to be a total shock to all you never see this coming. Elder Scrolls two Daggerfall. Um, this game I had gotten back in the uh, the mid mid nineties, late nineties. Um, didn't really know what I was getting into. I never played an Elder Scrolls game at the time. It was still kind of a an early franchise at the time, only with two, like two entries. But um, I really didn't know what I was getting into with Elder Scrolls uh, Daggerfall, and I'm glad I didn't because there's really nothing like it at the uh, I'd ever played, and I honestly haven't played anything like this really since. Uh, I got into the game. I went through the dungeon. I'm like, okay, I've played like, you know, I think I have a holder and a couple other games like that. First person uh, RPGs, but, um, nothing like the, del the dagger fall. <laughs> I got out of the dungeon and I'm like, man, this world, uh, it's like, it's taking a long time. I, I looked at the world map and I'm like, okay, I, I think I need to go South to the city. And so I start walking. I, th I think I actually got glitched out here this for this recording. I was grabbing a recording I did a couple years ago. Um, uh, and I walked to the, my first city and it took about 10 minutes. <laughs> and that was one pixel south from your starting position on the map. And then it was then when I realized just how freaking gargantuan this world was. Uh, so huge that there's no way you're ever going to see it all. There's absolutely no way you're ever going to see it all. So it's that, that really, really, uh, interested me in the game, just the colossalness of the world and how open it was. I actually never, uh, for the longest time, I never even pursued the main story just because there's so many cool, uh, interesting nooks and crannies around the world. Uh, countless cities, towns, dungeons, crypts, graveyards, uh, temples, uh, just, it, it, it felt like you're opening up like the McNally Atlas or Google maps or whatever. And, uh, looking like as if you pulled up in Google maps, it's like, where should I go next? That's basically Daggerfall, the RPG. And, uh, it's amazing how the sense of scale can really enhance your, your uh, feeling of being in a world where you get used to this. And it's, it's actually frustrating in other games where you go to this, the biggest city in the game and it's like 10 buildings and you're like, really? That's the biggest city in the game where in the biggest city in Daggerfall is like 
probably several hundred um, people living in dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of buildings, uh, complexes, shops, castles, keeps, things like that. And they actually have like shopping districts with various uh, sh- uh, town um, uh, armors and clothiers and banks and everything like things that you don't even really need. Like clothing is completely useless in this game, yet there are cl- clothiers in almost every single major town. Uh, there are jewelers. <laughs> there are uh, tons and tons of different um, major and local uh, guilds. There are like, the Fighters Guild, the Mages Guild, the Thieves Guild, um, the Dark Brotherhood, but there's also localized guilds like, you know, the Knights of the Dragon and things like that, which are only lo- um, exist in various regions of the, um, uh, there's one of the, one of the various regions in, in the game. There's like a dozen regions or more, actually more than a dozen regions. Uh, and they all have their own benefits and, and uh, you want to actually gain rank in these various guilds and, and, uh, places to gain these abilities, like being able to make your own spells, craft your own spells, craft your own items. Uh, it's just a, there was just so many options in this game that made it just really, really interesting. And on top of the atmosphere, it really felt like an endless, endless fantasy world. You could, you could just continue to explore over, over countless hours, which, uh, very few games managed to create that illusion and this game created that illusion in spades. And despite some rough edges, some very rough edges, like, you know, bugs and, you know, voids and, uh, you know, walls that wouldn't quite work or disappear or ceiling or floors you'd fall through. Um, you dealt with it because there was no other game that attempted to do anything like this. Uh, you know, actually having to, you know, stay at an inn to, to rest up or else you pass out in the middle of the street, things like that. It's just a, so much true. You can actually buy a house in almost every single town you you went to. There's usually always, or any town of the bank, I should say, almost every town of the bank had one to sometimes a dozen or so houses for sale. You could buy a boat, you know, you could, uh, uh, just travel around, uh, to crypts and stuff and occasionally find maps to new dungeons. And a lot of these dungeons were, uh, procedurally generated so they were pretty much countless never ending uh quests were randomly generated uh quite often Uh, main quests were obviously fairly fairly structured but the uh randomized side quests and things like that were all endless it just felt like you could just kind of make your way in this fantasy world like it i think i said in my my documentary uh analysis video um it felt like a fantasy life simulator and that's that's what i had always wanted as a kid like i wanted to live in a world rather than play somebody else's D&D campaign. And uh, yeah, I I, uh, uh, I really admired um, how ambitious this game was. I still consider it the most ambitious RPG ever made. And I think I still hold by by that because it's, it's just an incredible... Uh, it may not have attained everything it tried to do, but look at this. You're freaking fighting in court after trying to, after stealing somebody's belongings. You're trying to plead not guilty in court so as to avoid a prison sentence which if you actually are found guilty and uh, they charge you with that, you actually have to spend real life in-game days, sometimes like a month or more in in, pr- in jail, which can actually mess up ca- uh, various quests, can actually end uh, quest deadlines, uh, main quest uh, schedules can get screwed up because of it intentionally, obviously. You know, I'm only gonna be here for four weeks if you're in prison for four weeks, that person's gone. They they are not coming back. So like real life, real consequences for your actions, which you don't really see that much in modern games. So yeah, no, it's a, I'll, I wouldn't call it a through and through 100% masterpiece, but it tries to do so many things that games, most RPGs never even attempt. So all right. <laughs> the prequel to <laughs> Phoenix Wright. Oh man, if you could do a Phoenix Wright mod for a Daggerfall, that'd be amazing. It's like you're sentenced to. I object. <laughs> All right, another game. I'm sure you guys are going to be shocked to find out that it's one of my favorites. Oh, it's, it's not a system shock reference, by the way. It's just <laughs> I was make I wasn't making a pun. Uh, where is it?
Fallout 2. Um, for those wondering, I would probably say Fallout 1 has the better story, uh, better villains, better boss, etc. Et but Fallout 2 is just so much bigger, so much more open, so much more things to do that because I'm more of a do your own thing type of RPG player rather than a main story quest type of player, I prefer the the huge open world of Fallout 2 versus the smaller but more hand tailored and better story told version in Fallout 1. So um basically uh Fallout 2 is just your the closest thing to post apocalyptic uh life simulator, you know, kind of like in the vein of Daggerfall but a one of the most in-depth and entertaining uh, CRPGs I've ever played. You'd really have to look um, pretty uh, pretty far to see a game that does so many different uh, has so many different options for doing things than you, you can in Fallout. Be it you know lock picking, uh, hacking, gambling, sneaking, shooting, punching, throwing, all that kind of stuff, or talking. Um, it's, it's back when games actually were built around choice. You know, RPGs were built around choice. Like we see a lot of, um, I, I don't like to bash them because I actually enjoyed the games, but later later RPGs like, say, Mass Effect, which give you the semblance of choices and decisions, but in the end, it was one addressing. This game lets you uh, be a complete and utter tool and do some incredibly... Uh, loud and uh, uh, horrible things. If you want, you can like murder children. <laughs> you can you can uh, sell your your you can get married and sell your wife for prostitution. You can do lots of horrible horrible things in this game, or you can be a super you know savior of the wastes and do everything that's good. Or you can you can uh you know uh do some a quest and then say oh don't pay me the you know doing a good deed was good enough and. Uh, yeah, I know it, it, it ranges the spectrum. You can be the most depraved, horrible, slave trading, god awful monster that's ever roamed the earth, or you can be, uh, you know, the second coming of Jesus. But, uh, yeah, I know it's, it's a, it's definitely a game that I think, um, if you can stomach the, you know, I, I think it still looks pretty good. I think it has a really good color palette and pretty decent graphics for the time. But, um, if you can deal with the kind of, you know, somewhat dated 2D presentation. Uh, it, it really, uh, really just, uh, it goes all out and, and takes, uh, I, I mean, it was also kind of going against the grain because a lot of RPGs around the time were just all fantasy, 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 fantasy. In fact, Interplay was actually, uh, I think they had the D&D license at the time or was one of the main D&D licensees at the time. But um, Brian Fargo was just sick of doing nothing but D&D games. So they was like, let me do something different. And so this was a passion project. Or sorry, uh, not Brian Fargo, um, Tim McCain. Uh, and so he and a couple others just kind of came up with this concept. It's supposed to be like a time traveling game with like dinosaurs and stuff like that. And eventually evolved into basically Mad Max. Mad Max meets a boy, boy and his dog meets, you know, Flash Gordon meets uh, all these other things. But it just made this incredible world that we we couldn't get enough of and filled with mutant animals and and uh depraved raiders and and uh you know power suit wielding um uh, you know evil <laughs> evil government agents and things like that thanks for the uh the, the super chat and i thanks so much for the donation um, I've been meaning to get into Underrail. I haven't gotten into it very far. Um, when I played a bit, it definitely felt like Fallout. I just, for some reason, was turned off by it. I need to try it again, though, and I saw that there was an expansion out for Underrail, so I should definitely try that out. There's also Adam RPG, which is also a really good um, classic Fallout-style RPG that I recommend. Um, it's made a few couple difference, a couple differences here and there, but it, it definitely feels like the OG games of its day. Yeah, and, and yeah, and, and just like in uh, other classic uh, CRPGs, like uh, the horrible things you did in this game would be remembered. Like uh, every time you dug up a grave, it would give you the grave robber uh, trait. 
uh, every time if you killed a child, you'd give the child killer trait and people would remember that and judge you horribly by it. They would actually uh, give you like treat you like a monster uh, in some cases like you were, you know, how they always knew it. It was hard to, it's, it's kind of a gamey thing, but no, they would actually, you would do some things that would kind of uh, irrevocably ruin certain uh, paths for you to do in the game. Like I actually played a, a uh, <laughs> I purposely made a really flawed character last time I live streamed this um, where I played uh, Roy Drager, who is like a, a um, an addict uh, of like, buff out and uh jet he was just constantly uh taking uh taking these drugs and uh he was also like um cripplingly stupid but exceptionally strong so he became like a a, a a championship boxer but he didn't he couldn't um he couldn't uh explain himself well enough to actually get his car repaired so I was a mainly focused character who had to constantly take drugs to survive or else I would have like terrible uh, reactions to um, withdrawal reactions. But I was also so dumb that I couldn't explain what I, what the car part I needed. So I could never actually get a car in the game. Like that's the kind of game it was like you have to live with your decisions and some of your decisions make it much harder. Uh, so yeah, no, it's, it's the kind of game. It's a, it's a role playing game. You actually play a role and your decisions both help you and hinder you and uh a lot of games that pose as role-playing games nowadays that the game designers don't like blocking off choices to players they like to they like every player to have a quality experience that has all avenues potentially explored whereas you know games like these they saw the value in things you could do but they also saw the value in things you could be blocked off from depending on your play style so it just gives it, it, it's kind of the, it's kind of the, uh, the paradox where it's like, you want to have every, want to have every player have every, uh, opportunity and see every nook and cranny of your game world. But at the same time, if they do that, there's no sense of choice. Like if choice A and choice B take you down the same path, why have a choice? You know what I mean? Yes, choice A will mean, mean it so that they don't see choice B. But if you get the same results either way, then there's no choice. There's no illusion of choice. There's no semblance of a choice. So by making, by making your choices and paths actually matter and actually block off some content, you make your choices have, have more impact. And you also increase replayability quite a lot. And a lot of modern uh, mainstream games kind of don't really consider the value of that. I, th I think, I think a lot of game designers are kind of terrified of blocking off content to players. So, um, I don't, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if, uh, they censored the, I'm thinking the European version might be still censored. Um, I don't know. I, I usually play the default game and I believe when I streamed, I actually was able to do everything in, that the original game let me do. So I don't think it's been censored since it was released, at least in the States, but I can't say for other places. Maybe you can just like VPN and get the United States version or something, because that's the version that lets you do all the really bad things. <laughs> all right. So that was fought to um, random game, but I tried to kind of Vary up my list here a bit. Uh, Titanfall 2. Um, I This one's an interesting one because I probably clocked in a lot more hours in the multiplayer than I did the single player. But both are exceptional. I was a uh, day one Titanfall fan uh, player and really, really loved the, the, the attrition uh, multiplayer mode game loop but saw that there was like something kind of missing in the game, like not quite enough different play styles, not enough, quite enough equipment. And despite having a lot of really, really well-designed maps, I mean, these are like the, uh, the same crew, the, the modern warfare two crew, um, you know, still that, that same really high quality, uh, uh, game designers. But there's something missing. Titanfall two was the answer to those, to those nagging issues of the first game. They had a lot more, 
a lot more loadout customization. Uh, they took the, the light, medium, uh, heavy Titan ideas uh, and built them into classes, basically. Before, you could either do a light, medium, or heavy Titan and uh, customize them how you saw fit. They took that and instead make them into classes, which took a little bit of the customization away from you for Titans, but gave each Titan build much more character. Like the Ronin is actually a sword, a, a giant, you know, Titan that wields a sword. Uh, there's like the big minigun Titan. There's the, um, the flamethrower Titan. There's the, uh, later on, I think that, I think there might've been a DLC. They added in the Monarch, which was kind of my favorite now, which is a Titan that can actually steal shields from other people. And actually, uh, in their finisher move can actually, you can actually jump out of your Titan, go into the other guy's Titan, pull out their battery right before smashing them to bits. But um, it, it, it all revolves around a really simple concept that it was incredibly inspired in that it's the cat and mouse gameplay of mech versus uh, on foot soldier. And they did the smart thing by not making mechs ridiculously overpowered. They are extremely overpowered. They are extremely powerful. But a really good pilot on the ground can take out a Titan solo. So uh, the Titan can obviously squish or punch a guy in one hit. They have more powerful weaponry, but they're also less mobile and they're a much bigger target. And there are many areas that are inaccessible to them. So the level design is really where Titan fall kind of makes this gameplay loop work is that there's always little crevices and, and uh, you know, walkways and hidden corridors that uh, pilots can go into um, or, you know, run up the wall or parkour around, whereas the Titan is big and bulky and is always a big bulky target that can't get into the small areas. But um, yeah, and they also made the, the smart decision to make the Titans uh, feel like you're a big soldier. Like they could have made the Titans very bulky and very complicated to work like a tank, but they decided to make them fairly nimble and feel like you're playing a soldier. So you're not disconnected from playing on foot and on a Titan. But a really good Titan player can get a huge kill streak if they're smart. So there, there's that, that constant cat and mouse gameplay that makes it really, really interesting. And uh, that translates to really, really well when you add um, in multiplayer, for example, you add in um, bot units because it would have been, I think it would have been uh, not nearly as cool to be a Titan if all you're trying to do is hunt tiny little players. So they add a lot of um, ground troops as well. And what the ground troops do is they allow not only for more, more types of play styles, I'll get to that in a bit, um, but they allow for fodder for the Titans because it, it creates your illusion of being powerful by being able to squash like five, um, you know, ground units at, in it with one footstep. That makes you feel super powerful and super awesome when you're in a Titan. And you wouldn't have gotten that that uh, feeling had you just been playing against other ground players. Yeah, I know. I'd love to play a MechWare game that had the infantry like like this. That'd be super cool. Yeah, if uh, if Respawn made a MechWare game, I'd be totally down. Um, but what what so that creates like a really interesting dynamic. Whereas you know you're struggling a little bit with it with the the troops on the ground as a soldier, you can just like literally punch them or squash them to death as a uh, as a Titan. So that creates that that semblance of power that you wouldn't normally uh, have if it was all those players. So, um, but what's also cool about that is you can actually win or greatly aid your team in modes like attrition, which is basically just team deathmatch. You can greatly aid your allies in, in attrition. If you uh, focus on those little uh, mobs, those little, mo those little uh, AI dudes, I get so many points by just killing l little, little mobs and just like blasting them with a shotgun blast throwing a fire grenade into them, squishing with a Titan. I usually always get the most uh, mob kills, which isn't particularly, uh, you know, doesn't have a lot of glor glory in it, but hey, they're points and they can do the same thing to us. But if you do it, you get that advantage. So it's almost like having a side objective that you can do to get extra points, kind of like in, in basketball where, some, you know, if something happens, you can actually throw, 
you know, throw, uh, get a turn to throw directly into the hoop without anybody interfering. So there's that kind of side objective there. And, uh, well, that's all fine and good. And the game was designed as a multiplayer only game initially. How do you convert that into a single player campaign? And that's what brings Titanfall 2 from a really good, really unique and fun. And one of my, probably one of my favorite multiplayer shooters ever, possibly my favorite multiplayer shooter ever into a, a similarly exceptional single player game. I wouldn't say that Titanfall 2 on its own uh, as a single player game is the best game in the world. I'd say, I'd probably say like Doom 2016 is a, is a, um, probably in my opinion, more fun as a single player campaign, but Titanfall 2 has a really good single player campaign because it's constantly throwing something new at you. Unlike a lot of other shooters, especially shooters that actually some of these guys actually worked on in the past, like Modern Warfare, for example, uh, they usually kind of throw, you know, with some variants, they kind of throw the same sort of thing at you. Wave of enemies, kill them all, go to the next area. Wave of enemies, kill them all, go to the next area. Titanfall 2 has some of the most creative uh, level design I've ever seen, just thematically and mechanically. Um, not to spoil too much, but um, there are levels where the level is being built around you as you're as you're jumping from platform to platform. So you're having to like react to the world being built and forming while you're like leaping off of ledge to another ledge. Um, there's levels where you have to jump out of your Titan, uh, fight some guys on foot, get through a door, jump back in your Titan and go further, you know, kind of playing with that dynamic. There's, there's levels where you're separated from your Titan. So you actually have to go on foot while kind of like watching your Titan kind of aid you and maybe give you orders, whatnot. Um, one of my favorite levels, uh, was really creative and doesn't have to do with Titans at all. It's mind boggling to me to even think about. It's a time traveling level where they actually have two versions of the same level running at the same time. Uh, and you can switch between them, each of them instantly. There's a future level and a past level, and you can use a, a thing to switch between to the, from the future to the past. And so you might go into a room that's empty, switch to the past, it's full of enemies. Switch back to the future, the enemies are gone. But the enemies are still there, but you're not there anymore. And you actually have to think with the you have to think with that mechanic throughout the entire level. And uh, I think that it was a incre just incredibly creative. Uh, you know, the, the villains and the writing um, dialogue isn't always incredible, but you, you grow a really strong bond with your your Titan who has an AI in it and has a kind of a quirky AI character and eventually, yeah, it, it actually has a pretty interesting story. If not, if not a really inter uh, incredible storyline, it has really well done character, I think. And yeah, the, the, uh, fantastic and creative level design makes the campaign uh, a whole lot better than it has any right to be. That should say, I should say that. So, um, yeah, yeah, the time travel level was really, really creative. I hate to spoil it for people, but it is it's really something you should check out. It I've never seen I probably the most creative level I've ever seen in a first person shooter, I'll say that. Um somebody said, uh what's your opinion on Disciples Three? I actually love Disciples. Uh I didn't really play the original, but I played Disciples Two a lot. I love those games. I have to save scum with because I can't I can't take it when my characters die. But um, Disciples 3 just seemed like a really big downgrade, a virtual, a very beautiful game, but a visual downgrade from uh, Disciple, or sorry, visual, huge visual upgrade, but it felt like a poor, shallow interpretation of 2. Um, and the worlds were just so much smaller. Yeah, they, they really kind of misfired with, type, with uh, Disciples 3. It was a completely different company too, so that probably had something to do with it. But yeah, Disciples 2 is awesome. Disciples 3 is pretty to look at, not so fun to play. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody, for uh, hopping in. Um, sorry, I'm I, uh, not answering all these questions. I'm trying to get through all these before my, get, my voice gives out. I have a few more here. Uh, Getting some flack for this one, but hey, just being honest here. Uncharted 2. <laughs> um, this 
had I played this now, I probably wouldn't even gotten very far into the game. But playing it whenever it was, what was that, like 2010, 11, whatever it was. Um, this was a really, really, uh, it did exactly what it set out to do really well. It was basically an Indiana Jones simulator, right? You're on a quest to figure out this mystery, it's high stakes action. You're climbing on trains, you're, you know, swinging ropes, you're, you're shooting off bad guys, you know, nameless bad guys, uh, to get to this mysterious treasure that, uh, I forget what the plot of this one was a Shangri-La or something like that. Um, and it has had a, an amazing spirit, an amazing tone to it. Things never got, uh, too heavy. Um, but it was just enough, uh, action and, and pacing game, uh, slow down a couple parts toward the end where they got into really long puzzle sequences but the pacing this game was just really really exceptional just when you thought you were getting a little bit tired of something it would throw a new a new thing at, uh, at you and uh it definitely focused on spectacle um just like this section is probably this is the kind of famous train section where you're not only having to climb on this train and get to the front while fighting bad guys but you're also having to worry about getting hit by trees hitting get hit by signs hit by poles uh, while this whole train is moving through this environment. Really, it must have been uh, a heck of a lot of work to get <laughs> uh, all of this working. Um, there's one sequence, I believe, in Uncharted 2 where you're actually fighting in a building while the building is toppling over. So not only is the entire uh, uh, room you're in tilting over, boxes are sliding down, cover is shifting, Everything is is out of whack, so uh, they just really kind of hit that sort of. Um, I, I, I hate to word that use the word cinematic, but they're kind of going for that kind of Hollywood explosive action set pieces, and uh, I think it really paid off. I, I, I really enjoyed my time with Uncharted Two. I didn't really like the first one that much. Uncharted Three, I played through it. It, it didn't really do my uh, do much for me, and like I said, now. If I were to play a game like this now, I'd probably, I've seen so many games take this kind of approach now. It's not so novel anymore. I don't know if I'd, I'd never even finish Uncharted 4, to be honest. But this game, I think it was just the right time at the right place. And I was able to dig into it and enjoy it a lot. And I played it recently with a remaster and um, it was still a whole lot of fun. It's still my favorite of the series. It just had that, that classic um, mix of, uh, Hollywoodized action, Indiana Jones esque, you know, punch him, throw him off the the ledge. Uh, let's let's get to the you know, let's get to the secret thing before the bad guys do. Uh, kind of attitude, and you know, I grew up with Indiana Jones, so this sort of this sort of uh, you know, adventure, you know, high stakes adventure sort of action movie uh, really, uh, gameplay really appealed to me. So, yeah. It had, it had a good humor, a good characterization, you know, love him or hate him. Nolan North has a, has a ton of charm in this game. Uh, the other characters feel like real people. You feel like the real conflict between, you know, him and it is, is like kind of like a strange, you know, love interest. Um, but by the end, you're just rooting to get it, get through it and get to the place before the bad guys do. Just like the, the third game, it, it, evol it devolves a little bit toward the end, but it was just a solid fun experience back when Naughty Dog was actually wanting to make fun adventure, uh, fun <laughs> games. Like I think, I think, uh, Neil Druckmann, like, uh, actually made a rule at the offices not to use the word fun anymore. And I'm like, what the hell, man, what has happened to you? But, uh, yeah, this was, uh, I think, uh, I know she did. I think she did three as well and started working on four, but, uh, Amy Hennig's, I think this is her, her magnum opus. I think, uh, definitely. I know she did some other work before, but, uh, it, I was just completely enthralled by this game. It had a great, great, uh, tone to it and, uh, adventurous spirit. And I have not seen many other games, so I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. I don't recommend the shadow and FPS. The, the original, uh, console games were a lot of fun, both the SNES and the Genesis versions, which, are very different, by the way, as I'll explain in my next video. Um, but um, and the Shadow and Returns games are are really good. I'd say they're better RPGs um, than the originals. 
have more uh, much better storylines um the genesis game um back in the day had some really cool kind of proc gen uh quests and systems but yeah if you have to play one of them i'd say play shutter uh play shutter one dragonfall that game was um i'd say overall in terms of plot gameplay presentation everything the best uh shutter one game made so far All right. Yeah, uh, Shutter uh, Dragonfall is awesome. I really like that. Really good characters, interesting plot, great world, and it was like XCOM RPG uh, gameplay with multiple uh, varying, wildly different uh, classes. So I I really enjoyed my time with Dragonfall. All right, next up. Uh, probably my favorite JRPG ever made. Um, Final Fantasy VI comes pretty close. Uh, Final Fantasy VII comes pretty close to that. But if I had to, if I had to pick one game, and I, I recently replayed this with my, with my fiance, actually within the last year, all the way through, I, if I had to pick one JRPG to replay, I'd play Chrono Trigger. It's just that good. Um, it's, again, just the, the, the kind of thematic scope of it. Um, you can you can travel from the prehistoric age to the Middle Ages to sort of like a kind of semi-imperial age to the future to you know at a time. It's just got such a or to like the Dark Ages too. Um, it's got such a, a wide variety of uh, characters, of locations, absolutely beautiful uh, artwork, uh, funny moments, uh, sad moments you know, legitimately, uh, kind of tearjerker moments, uh, extremely atmospheric moments. Like this is when you're in the future where, uh, you go into the future and find out what happened to the world. I'm renounced to you. Something bad happens in the future and you have to discover what went wrong. Um, yeah, no, I don't want to spoil much of it, but, uh, it, it is such a, a fascinating, uh, fascinating game and uh this was during the i think the absolute peak of square uh squares um quality like this is like a couple years a year or two after final fantasy 6 a uh, year or two before final fantasy 7 you know right around that era they just could do no wrong practically and so this is like peak square squares off in my in my book um Great story, great interesting characters, just fascinating locations, really imaginative locations. I won't get into the details, but, um, and yeah, just atmospheric, like, a, and, and probably the thing that makes Chrono Trigger really, 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 uh, fun to play and replay, in my opinion, which makes games like Final Fantasy, uh, six and seven, not so fun to replay, <laughs> Um, Chrono Trigger, you can all usually always avoid a battle if you want to, and you always see them on screen, usually always see them on the screen before you can fight them. So every encounter feels organic. You can actually see the enemies run, running over there. So you're like, ah, oh, you know what? I need to heal. I'm going to run back and heal and I'll be back. Um, you can do that in Chrono Trigger. Occasionally you'll get ambushed, but you'll only get ambushed that one time. Unlike Final Fantasy, where you get ambushed again and 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 again. I replayed uh, Final Fantasy VII again, and I was like, I'd walk literally four to five steps, random battle. Four another four or five steps, random battle. And that was at the end uh, part of the game. I was heading down this like spiraling tower, and I realized I was taking going the wrong way. I had to walk back up, battle, 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 battle. Um. And just the, the variety of the of the types of enemies and the environments and the characters you're going to be interacting with and exploring, uh, just because you're you're time traveling across the whole world, um, it, it means that it never stays out, out stays as welcome. That's the that's the greatest thing I think that Chrono Trigger does. Uh, if I could just sum it up into like just a few words, it never outstays your welcome. It's welcome. Um, there's one of the most memorable parts, memorable locations in the game. It's like literally four screens long, has its own sound music soundtrack, uh, 
couple of his own unique creatures, unique look to it. It's like the Mystic Forest or whatever. Um, it's very short. You have to run through it like four or five times in the game, maybe. And it's incredibly memorable, and you love it because it's got such a great atmosphere, got such a memorable music. Probably Square, I would argue, Square's best soundtrack ever made. Like this, Final Fantasy VI and Final Fantasy VII, I'd say, are definitely up there, but I'd almost argue Chrono Trigger was, was the best out, out of those three. Um, yeah, um, uh, Mitsuda, uh, Mitsuda did the music. I think he got sick, and so I think uh, Umatsu had to take over, but Umatsu actually researched his, his uh, uh, spe specific music style and uh looked at the, looked at his structure and um harmony and continued in that style so it was really mitsuda's style from the beginning but um umatsu had to finish it up because i think i think mitsuda was getting sick and he couldn't finish the project or whatever so it was uh, a collaboration but really in this style and the the original um design of mitsuda so Was it Umatsu? I thought I got the story wrong. I don't know. Either way, it really, really great, so really, really great uh, soundtrack. Okay, maybe I got it mixed up, but um, yeah, no, uh, it's great, great, uh, great setup. Again, you know, it's 1994, 1995, whatever it was. Um, you're not going to get the incredibly, uh profound dialogue that you're going to get in expecting games now, but it was serviceable. You got the characters, you know, there was like this, the kind of smart brainy, brainy girl. There was like the more, um, flippant, um, semi bubbly girl. There was, you know, the main guy who I, I don't actually know if Chrono ever talks. I think, I don't think he does. Um, you got like the noble knight. you've got the kind of robot with a heart of gold kind of things like that. So they're, they're, they're fairly, archetypical characters but they're lovable you know you like the look of them you like the the way they talk uh you know some of the history between the different characters so despite not necessarily being the equivalent of a shakespearean play it, it, it's good enough to get you invested in the characters in the story and the story isn't very interesting the settings are really interesting and it's driven by this, these settings that gets you invested in the world and because it's a time traveling game you get to revisit uh, periods and locations over time and see how they evolve. And what's crazy is that when you change things in the past, the future things uh, change too. So it's really, uh, really great. Yeah, like some uh, Bilbo Baggins said in the comments, pacing is Chrono Trigger's greatest asset. Yeah, extremely well paced, extremely uh, uh, inviting. Every new location is interesting. Um, I, I think I. Uh, can't remember i think maybe one section of the game i kind of groaned a little bit going back into it but as much as i love some games like final fantasy 6 and 7 there's many sections in those games where i'm like oh no not this area because i remember how long it was or how uh aggravating it got or some mechanic that was in was introduced that was annoying or i just remembered how long a particular stretch was that i'm going to get um random encounter attacks again and again and again Chrono Trigger was basically the answer to the annoying things that kind of cropped up in JRPGs. And because of that, it's one of the most fun and replayable JRPGs uh, ever made, I think. So, um, yeah, no, definitely check it out if you haven't played it. Um, Steam version, iffy, uh, check it out. I, I heard that they fixed some of the issues with it. Um, otherwise, uh, SNES or... Uh, I, I don't know if it's on the, the Switch Retro Store or anything like that, but look it up. There's there's easy ways to to play it. I prefer the SNES version. A lot of people prefer the DS version. Um, whatever floats your boat. Can't really go wrong. So uh, probably my favorite JRPG of all time is uh, Chrono Sugar. And up next. Uh, Diablo uh, 2. So, very, very much a... Uh, 
it's it's i mean it really needs no introduction it was probably the most it was easily the most popular uh action rpg for years um and it's one of those games where you almost don't have to define it because uh almost every game with rpg elements nowadays has borrowed from the diablo franchise i mean essentially uh it's a little known secret but diablo basically borrowed elements from rogue brought them into uh real time it's supposed to be a roguelike uh even down to the turn-based elements diablo was they smartly decided to change it to real time which was a really popular decision and then they added they basically added uh the dungeons and dragons uh manual uh bag of tricks like the, their um their item generator <laughs> that's basically where diablo came from they took the dungeons and dragons item generator where you take like you know flaming sword of uh keenness or whatever and create items and that was a brilliant and ridiculously uh uh popular hit and so what diablo did uh diablo 2 went further they actually took a little bit diablo 2 is like four to five steps forward like one step back i'd say um diablo 2 uh, somebody said it best actually um i think it was Zarek or somebody else uh, said it best is Diablo two is a much better multiplayer game. Whereas Diablo one is probably a better single player game. And I could see that, um, Diablo two is much more accessible. You know, he has running, which Diablo one, if you don't remember, he just like, you walked everywhere and took forever. Diablo two has running. It has multiple, uh, much more classes and many, many more abilities that you can kind of delve with and, and build in. Cause you had, a, I think like a handful of classes plus, each class had three branches to kind of branch out into, um, especially with the expansion. You could, uh, you know, like you could be a, 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 a druid, like a shape-shifting druid, or it could be a summoner druid, for example. So that's the kind of play styles you're going to get. And so it definitely kind of pigeonholed you more into your the class you chose, whereas the original Diablo, you could be a fighter that could eventually become sort of a mage or a mage that could be eventually become sort of a fighter or like spell sword. Um, Diablo 2 definitely kind of pigeon, pigeonholed you more into your class. Like there's class restric restricted items, class restricted abilities, etc. cetera. But um, overall, you can pretty much go with the idea that Diablo 2 was essentially a much more, uh, had a lot more variety, a lot more levels, a lot more everything. And, and huge everywhere environments. You weren't just restricted to dungeons. It was a huge, it was a huge step forward in a lot of ways. So yeah. Um, Although it lost a little bit of the multi-classing and, and uh, freedoms of the original, it gained so much more in, in the process. Um, yeah, no, uh, Diablo 2 is just kind of legend. I mean, it, there were just uh, so many great um, moments with that game. I <laughs> I didn't, never told the story, but or I told the story a couple of times, but uh, I remember <laughs> distinctly my uncle was getting married and... Uh, Diablo 2 was coming out, and so I stayed home and played Diablo 2 instead with my brothers instead of going to my uncle's wedding. I feel bad about that, but um, that was how great this game was. And uh, yeah, and honestly, I've played lots of games. There's a lot of great games out there that do this sort of uh, this sort of action RPG gameplay extremely well. Um, I've heard Wilson is good. I bought Wilson years ago. Uh, wasn't great at the time. But I've heard it's gotten a lot better. Uh, and I've played, obviously, Path of Exile. Um, I still need to play the new expansions. But there's just something about Diablo 2 that it kind of became the gold standard. Even though it's, you know, become much uh, very dated since. In terms of the uh, visuals and the frame rate and whatnot. There's still people who play it professionally today. You know, and do crazy things with it. So if a game can hold up 20 years... Uh, and still be mimicked and not quite imitated, uh, or still imitated but not, but not quite duplicated. You you must have done something pretty pretty damn good. So, uh, yeah, and I I I was a necro player. Um, always liked uh, creating a ridiculous amount of skeletons and my golem and clog up all the the narrow <laughs> passageways, which every other player of course loved. But. Um, yeah, they keep on patching it. Uh, you can actually, uh, if you're going to play it, um, 
this is typical Blizzard. You have to buy the game and the expansion separately, which is game's 20 years old. Come on. But uh, you have to, if you want to buy it legally and play it online, uh, you can buy it. You still buy it on the Blizzard store, I believe. And, uh, and uh, buy the base game and the expansion. Um, but I recommend there's, uh, it won't mess up your online play, I don't think. Uh, there's the thing called, I think, the Sven Wrapper. A uh, guy named Sven, I think he's Swedish or something like that. He he developed a 3DX, a 3DFX Voodoo Wrapper, which lets you run the game in the 3D accelerated mode. Um, just like um, you could back in the day. So, you know, it was a pretty, a pretty great, uh, pretty great, you know, awesome way of playing the game. Uh, you know, just like we also just did in the past. Hope this is not spam, but uh, thank you, your cheap date. I hope that hopefully, hopefully you're not a spam character, spam account, but um, thank you for the $50. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, Diablo 2. Um, easily one of the best uh, action RPGs of all time and still imitated. Uh, still has tons and tons of meta and, and depth and everything and still get up and still gets updated once in a while with um, tweaks and patches. I think they're still running. I think they're still running seasons and stuff, not like updates, but like, um, people actually do like unofficial, um, seasons and, and competitions and stuff with the game. So pretty impressive after all this time. Not many games can, can, uh, own that. Uh, yeah, Jules, actually, I went over a couple of God games earlier on the list. Uh, that was one of the first games, a couple of the first games I went over and I probably left off a couple of games off of this list now that I'm looking back at it. But, um, it's already running into like three hours or so. So is what it is. Okay. Another random game, uh, probably my favorite game on the, on the NES, uh, Super Mario Bros. 3. Not a particularly uh, highbrow uh, choice, but I love this game, and I still love this game. Um, this was uh, third game in the in the series. Um, after we got Mario, the first one, and we got a rebranded, different game completely that was turned into Mario Two that retroactively was made into Mario Cannon. I, that was a weird story. If you look about look about if you look up Mario Two, we weren't actually getting Mario 2 or getting something else, but that's fine. Um, Mario 3 seemed like a nice... Mario 2 was a little bit divisive, I remember. Some people loved it, some people didn't like it. Had different characters, different stuff. It wasn't really a Mario game. That's why I felt, I felt so different. But uh, Mario 3 just felt like Mario on steroids. It just had so many new mechanics. Uh, it had, had a overworld. So instead of just going from level 1-1 one, one to level 1-2, level 1-3, you went to... Um, you could actually get on the map and on the overworld, there are, uh, more levels. Um, but there are also like side objectives too. So you, there's like, um, gambling ones where you could like try your hand at like slot machines to get new items and stuff like that. And it introduced the idea of, uh, overworld items. So you would have, you would keep your, you know, your, uh, raccoon tail or your, you know, various suits and things like that, or just being a larger Mario, but. Um, you could also get consumables that you could use in future levels. So it's like, oh man, if I, it'd be really cool if I had a raccoon tail in this future level, you could just use that in the, in between your, uh, you know, between this level and the next and have that for your next battle. And that was awesome. It was a really great, uh, really great time. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, kind of, uh, what am I, what am I trying to say? It, it really introduced another layer of gameplay to it but also um it it, it added like a kind of like a, a sense of strategy to the game um there's also uh secret levels hidden hidden uh, item shops and things like that uh and yeah there's still like this is kind of mind-blowing at the time but there's a way to skip all the way to like the last bowser uh stage within like the first minute or two if you know if you know two secrets which I still remember how to get to both of them after all these years, the two secrets to get to, uh, these two flutes, um, within your first few levels, you get those two flutes 
and you can use one flute to skip to like level to uh, world four or five, and you use the second flute to skip all the way to the end. So, um, an amazing game. They actually, uh, this was the main inspiration for the the Wii uh, Mario revival, which added uh, it was like Super Mario, new Super Mario Bros, whatever. And they did a, a Wii U version or whatever. I think they might have done one for the Switch as well. But it follows very much the Mario Three formula. We've got the overworld. You've got the consumable items uh, on the overworld. You've got all these other side objectives and stuff like that. They also added multiplayer, which was cool, but also led to a lot of accidental deaths. Um, but also, they they made each world really, really, really creative and interesting. Um, the the first world's pretty basic. I think there's like a Bowser one has got like a like a, a lot of guns and and like parades with with cannons and monsters and stuff. Um, but there's an ice world where everything's slippery. There's a, um, there's a big world where everything is huge and there's a small world where everything's tiny and they're like, each world has its own cool theme and, uh, they just played around with that. And, and it was kind of classic, classic Nintendo where they would, uh, try, they'd introduce some basic mechanics and then like try new things and, and mix and match and see how it goes. And yeah, it was just a really, really creative, uh, entry to the series. Um, before they just kept on kind of doing the same thing over and over again. I mean, you, you get occasional, it's not really fair to say that, I guess, but honestly, not all the ideas that Mario tried to do were great. Were great. Like, um, I know some people are huge Mario Sunshine fans. I was not one of them. <laughs> uh, Galaxy tried some cool stuff with gravity and stuff like that, but yeah, not, uh, this was before nostalgia became such a huge thing from Nintendo that they just kept on just doing what, what sold, doing what people liked again and again and again. They tried new things. They tried new creative ideas and Hey, it worked out. I thought it was a really fun entry to the series. Yeah. You never forget the flutes. And yeah, that was actually a big deal. Those were pretty secret until an actual Hollywood movie revealed them, uh, which was super weird back in the eighties for a Hollywood movie to reveal uh, how to get to secret levels in a Mario game, but that that's how it was. It was a it was definitely an interesting interesting development. Um, yeah, that's 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 how it be. Uh, there's one more game I want to talk about uh, that isn't on this list because I forgot. Let me pull it up here. I might as well do two, two other games. Let's see. Uh, all right, let's do this. Okay. So I realized early in the stream that I forgot to add two things. Um, so... Let me just set this up real quick. And while you look at some awesome uh, Mario 3 footage. <laughs> All right. So um, the first game by Trekka Games, former Fallout devs, Arcanum of Steamworks and Magic Obscura. This was a uh, kind of a, a pivot. Interestingly enough, Fallout was actually Tim Kaine's pivot away from uh, the uh, common Dungeons & Dragons license that Interplay had at the time. And uh, this was a pivot toward more uh, of, a, of an interesting setting. Like they, uh, they, didn't want to, they couldn't do just Fallout again because they had left Interplay and formed uh, Trick of Games. But uh, and they didn't want to go back to pure fantasy. So what did they do? They went to steampunk. And I, to this day, I consider this the uh, the gold standard for steampunk settings. Because a lot of steampunk games nowadays, especially, uh, they don't they don't really um, they don't really uh, 
they they don't really take it very seriously. They're like, okay, let's have some gears to something. Let's have some big guns with oversized parts and uh, have top hats and uh, kind of silly over oversized, you know, exaggerated clothing. And that's steampunk. Whereas this game actually took it uh, a really interesting direction where they took your standard fantasy setting, say like a Dungeons and Dragons, um, set it after a fantasy, a medieval fantasy apocalypse, basically during an industrial revolution. So you've got not only a fantasy world cla uh, on the decline, clashing with the growing and uh, technology of an industrial revolution, uh, but compounded with a, a, a distant uh, remnants of a past civilization, which was extremely advanced compared to the current one. So an extremely rich uh, setting uh, that few other games really uh, get into that far. And it is such a uh, shame that they never got the rights. Uh, they never got the rights or they never got a chance to make a sequel because the uh, setting was so uh, rich that it, you could easily go in so many directions with it. Um, had a sort of classiness to it that many, not many games did. Like they actually got a um, a professional uh, quartet uh, composer to do all the game's music in that kind of era of style a little bit. You could argue the that the string quartet is a little bit might be a little bit advanced for no actually no yeah no it'd be it'd be perfectly fine for this kind of era of, of technology um 1700s 1800s etc um but no it, it, they they really went all in on the on the setting uh everything about it is just really well executed um you know you could argue the visuals are a little bit dated even for the time you know i think this was turn of the century uh but they just, it's one of the truest RPGs I've ever played in, in terms of how much work they put into every location. Every building has doors uh, that get locked at night. People go into their doors, lock their doors, and go to bed and close their door to the bed and turn off their lights at night. Uh, windows are actually interactive. You can break open windows and sneak into houses at night. Uh, there's a 24-hour uh, schedule places don't open until a certain time they don't close at a certain time um yeah full day night cycle um time passes uh events change you can read the news on newspapers and uh the amount of writing in this game is actually staggering uh npcs will interact with you and and talk to you very differently depending on your race or on your class on your reputation on your clothing on your gender, all those kind of things. So uh, depending on that particular NPC's configuration, they may not like elves. They may not like dwarves or whatever. Um, your uh, All these elements are tallied up in sort of an, an impression. Uh, I don't forget what they call it. It's uh, something, something uh, there's a specific word for it in the game, but basically your first impression. Um, and so if you make wear a nice buckled up, you know, suit or whatever, you're going to have a better impression than if you're just wearing rags. So really, really a uh, uh, fascinating amount of detail that they put into the game. Um, they, they made probably the biggest mistakes that they made were probably in the, uh, the combat. Combat's not that great. They divided it up into uh, real time and, and, and turn-based. Real time is way too hectic. Turn base is all right, but it just doesn't have the impact or the, um, it's just a lot looser than say fallout was, but despite that, uh, there's just a lot of, a lot to do in the game, even as a, um, you can either be like a technologist or a mage or something in between, but because of the way the world works, basically mages defy the law of physics, whereas technologists, uh, reinforce the law of physics. So, if you have a, an affinity toward magic, that's going to affect badly affect your use of technology. If you have a, uh, an affinity toward technology, your spells are going to fizzle and screw up a little bit. Um, so you're going to, if you, unless you're just like down the road neutral, you're going to probably want to uh, sway one way or the other. Um, but even amongst these things, you have plenty of different things. You could become like an herbalist. You could become like a, uh, a gunsmith. 
You can put a blacksmith. Craft your own weapons, your own armor. Um, and you, for each uh, point you put into these different skills, for each point you put into these different skills, like yeah, blacksmithing or whatever, uh, you gain new new uh, recipes for blacksmithing. But uh, you can also then find recipes out in the wild for like making bullets or making more advanced rifles and stuff like that. And there's a really cool uh, part system in that in this game in that um, in random chests and, and like garbage cans and things like that in towns, you can you can uh, uh, go through the refuse there and find like pipes and cloth and things like that and bottles, discarded trash. And for example, bottle, I think bottle a uh, bottle and uh, a rag you can turn into a Molotov cocktail and things like that. So there's a kind of liveliness to the world and crafting and uh and that's just the technology side the magic side has tons of different uh magic schools including necromancy and and you know fireballs and all this other stuff um the game is not really balanced you know as many said you know you want to make a, a really powerful mage you can use the first level spell harm and that's like one of the best spells in the game unfortunately games aren't quite as as qa'd and as streamlined and as balanced as they are now but Despite all that, it's still an incredible experience, and the world is worth uh, visiting uh, and just uh, experiencing that that atmosphere and how uh, I, I said it in my video about Arcanum. What was it? It was um, the conviction to the setting that they that they put into it. It was just uh, enthralling. Like they took this world as as if it was serious. It was a, an extremely uh, well fleshed out, um, uh, and rapturing, uh, world, probably one of the, I'd say one of the top five settings I ever, ever had experienced in the game. Just really, really amazing and absolutely the gold standard for industrial fantasy, industrial revolution type setting or AKA steampunk. But I, I don't even want to call it like that because steampunk just has kind of a bad name now, but it's basically steampunk, but done really, really well. So you know, sounds good to you. Sounds good to you. Um, check out Arcanum. Hey, thanks, Chris. Yeah, it's actually I actually built it. This is a a real background with real. Uh, if I can touch it, a little bit too far away, but yeah, it's got a lot of LED lighting and everything in those real posters. But still working on it. It's a little bit busy, but I'll probably clean it up at some point. Um, so yeah, Arcanum, very very good game and uh, worth checking out. I. I, they have unofficial patches and stuff, which cleans, clean some things up. Um, but even in its default, it's still really, a really fun game. All right. Troika likes their long titles, don't they? Every one of their games has an incredibly long title. <laughs> uh, All right, Vampire of the Masquerade Bloodlines. Uh, this is the third Troika title. Um, it's, I actually was, when I was hearing about this game, I had played Vampire of the Masquerade Redemption and I'd really liked it. Uh, and when I heard that the next game would have been a, a first person, I, it was, this is how journalism was in the time. It wasn't very good. It said it was going to be a first person shooter. This game is not a first person shooter. You can technically... Uh, you can technically shoot in first person in Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, but calling it a first person shooter would be extremely, uh, extremely disingenuous. This is, I think it, I think they used the Half-Life in Half-Life 2 engine for this one. So it's got FPS in its blood, but as you can see, especially, uh, when you're doing melee and, and, uh, stealth is actually quite advantageous to go into third person. And you can actually do most of the game without killing people if you want to do a pacifist run or a stealth run. So uh, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines is one of the better immersive sims uh, ever released. Um, Deus Ex with Vampires is basically the best way to kind of uh, sell it to in a, in a sentence if you want to do that. But 
Um, and it is, it is actually, it does seem to get a lot of inspiration from games like Deus Ex. It's got like the, you know, uh, run and gun play style, uh, stealthy kind of sneaky play style, uh, hacky play style, etc. But it's kind of set in like a, a mid nineties, uh, kind of like indistinct mid nineties, uh, setting where like the computers, they're not really cell phones anywhere. Uh, you've got computers that have like DOS, you know, terminal screens and things like that. So it's got a really kind of interesting, uh, anachronism. And this was made in like 2004, I think 2004, 2005. So this is obviously set in like the kind of early, it's basically set when, when Vampire the Masquerade was actually written back in the nineties. So, um, but yeah, I you know here, here's, for example, a playthrough that I did with, uh, um, a sneaky vampire called an Asratu. And, uh, they're super interesting to play. Um, there's various clans, vampire clans who have very distinct looks and, uh, power sets and abilities. And each vampire will have a very different experience. These guys are horrific to look at. They look like monsters. You can't even walk into, uh, walk up to people, um, and greet them without being turned away in revulsion. Like you'll actually, if you go up to this diner, this lady will like scream and, and cops will come in to kill you. So what they did for that is they actually made an entire uh, alleyway and sewer system for the city. So you can actually uh, avoid human contact <laughs> by crawling through the sewers and eating rats <laughs> instead. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. You'd never see that in a game today. I mean, maybe they'll do that in Bloodlines too, but. Um, on the other hand, if you play like a Ventru, for example, a Ventru is a smooth talking kind of, uh, uh, intimidating, or you can use intimidation or you can use like persuasion or even uh vampire mind control to get your way. And they're so like the kind of upper class, um, snooty type where they won't even, uh, you can't even, uh, drink from the homeless or the, um, the rats will actually like puke up the blood. They like, Oh, I can't drink that disgusting blood. I need to like, you know, uh, I need somebody of higher class to drink from. So there you go. Like two polar opposites. One is going to, one can't even drink from rats and stuff like that and are going to have to use their persuasion skills to, to make their, uh, way through the world. Whereas the other can't do anything, but you know, drink off of homeless and, and, uh, rats and things like that. So, uh, those are just two of the clans. You also got like the Bruja clan, which is more like the kind of, you know, uh, brutish, uh, animalistic clan. I think they can get, uh, you know, wolf powers and things like that. You can also get, um, the, uh, Malkavians who are, are all have their own unique brand of insanity. And that's an interesting playthrough. Don't play through Malkavians as your first playthrough because that will be, uh, that will kind of ruin a bit bits of it. But yeah, Malkavians are are uh, fascinating to play through. Do that as like your second playthrough or something like that. But uh, they see the world in a very different way. <laughs> I'll put it that way. You can have conversations with like TV anchors and things like that, like through the TV and stuff like that in your head, of course. But no, it's very interesting. Uh, but there's basically, it really kind of reinforces. I don't know. I would say it's even, it even does the multiple playthrough styles even better than Deus Ex, to be honest, because it, it actually, uh, has to grapple with the idea that there's certain play styles that of like, you know, for example, the Nosferatu, they can't be seen by humans or else they'll be attacked and, uh, and, uh, revolted against. So that actually has to, the level design actually has to take into account these other, uh, extreme play styles like you can't be a horrific monster in deus ex but you can in in uh vampire the masquerade bloodline so i wouldn't say it's better in all ways than deus ex but i would say that it it uh it really takes to try to take that sort of um play by you know game design and level design by by creating various avenues uh, for to do each type of activity to a whole new level it is definitely, uh, you know, got some bugs. It's got some, uh, especially on release, it had some game breaking bugs. I actually played uh, a fairly early version, not even release version, but a fairly early version off of Direct to Drive. You remember back? If you remember Direct to Drive back the, back in the day, 
Um, and I actually got completely stuck at one point. But luckily, if you get the the game off of GOG, I think it has all the community patches and everything like that. The game, the company that made it uh, was basically going under at the time. So, and Activision just pushed it out to sh- store shelves. So it had a really really rough launch. But nowadays, it's pretty much per- uh, perfectly playful, uh, playable. You're not going to run into the the game breaking bugs or the issues that the the base game did. I know the modding community is still active, like 10 years on, 15 years on. So there's plenty of additional content, new clans, new abilities, new uh, things to do in the game. But yeah, I know this is a game you can really sink your teeth into, pardon the pun, uh, and find out all of its tricks. Like there's just so many little hidden gig, uh, gags and ways to get into things. I think like yeah, behind that, there's another little uh, hidden area you can use. Just like the vents in Deus Ex, there's like hidden areas. Uh, there's cameras. There's computers. There's all sorts of stuff. There is a lot of lot of such dense uh, level design. It isn't just designed to have this quarter you go through and then that quarter you go through. You actually have to observe and look at things and you know figure out your way of uh, of approach. But you can also just go in there guns blazing. That's totally fine too if you want to do that play style. I find it really interesting to kind of see what the game world has to offer. You know, can I lockpick this door and get in this way? Can I break through that window? Can I, uh, can I find, you know, in one area you, you can either go through the front door and have to shoot a bunch of guys in, in this, ha- this beach house with, uh, that all have guns, or you can find that there's a, some loose boards on the fence and go out through the back. You know, there's all, all these little hidden options everywhere. And depending on your character stats, you might have, hints uh, that might point those out to you or not. So yeah, no, uh, vampire, vampire Deus Ex is, uh, is definitely one of my favorites. Um, is, is an incredible, uh, incredible RPG experience. And, you know, despite being, you know, a bit long in the tooth now still looks pretty good. I mean, honestly, uh, uh, let's see the, yeah, here's the city street here. Um, it has a really great living, living, breathing world. Uh, most all the cities are revisitable and you'll find new things you can do as things open up. Um, if you, if you violate the masquerade too many times, you're in trouble. Um, but if you, if you show your, your vampiric true form, um, to somebody, you might actually get the cops called on you. And as you leave the building you're in, uh, you'll see cop cars at the front door. Like that's the kind of level this game does. It's really cool. It could do so much more, and I'm really, really, really hoping that they Bloodlines Two does that. But I have a feeling that what they did here was like just so risky and so uh, uh, beatnik that I don't, I don't know if an, a AAA game will kind of do that now. But I'm really hoping they do because I just love that idea of just like a vampire, you know, first person immersive sim vampire simulator. And this game comes close to that. It's still a structured, linear, fairly somewhat linear RPG. You know, you're essentially going to do steps A, B, and C to reach ending D, but how that happens and all the different variations of the ending and, and how you get there, the journey is the most fun thing about the game. You know, it's how you actually approach each area. Some areas are definitely not as balanced for some playstyles, for sure. Some areas are going to be absolutely ones you're going to want to sneak through. Some of them you just can't really sneak through, but... Imperfect game made by extremely ambitious developers. So yeah, definitely uh, it's a couldn't think of a more fitting game to end this list with was Vampire, uh, the Masquerade Bloodlines. So, um, yeah, yeah, the Masquerade thing is really interesting. I actually really got into the uh, tabletop game after playing Masquerade: The uh, Redemption. The tabletop game's lore is fascinating. Just how how many? I mean, they they even have like a vampire bible. <laughs> That's how far back they go with the with the lore. Uh, they have a whole setting for the Dark Ages. They have a whole setting for modern times. Um, uh, there's also a Victorian era one uh, version of Vampire the Masquerade. Yeah, they, there's a, so much lore to dig into with all the clans. The clans themselves are really really fascinating. Just how much um, how much goes into uh, you know, each clan and all their special abilities and things like that. Like, you know, you have the, the Tori Vor who are kind of like the artsy, um, appreciators of, of beauty, uh, you know, various other clans and stuff like that. But yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, 
definitely a game that you you know should be on the bucket list of any rpg player for sure so anyway guys uh that's my list for today um it's been a few hours now my voice is hoarse but i hope you guys find this interesting um i'll probably go back to having guests from now uh continuing on this is just kind of a one-off special thing where i wanted to go over my favorite games and i figured that'd be best to go on solo but um yeah hopefully you guys like my episode uh cyberpunk part two is on its way it's in editing now um script is finished so summer release hopefully and part three is mostly scripted so winter fall winter release for that probably but i'm hoping to get part two and three done by the end of the year that's my goal so anyway uh yeah anyway hope you guys enjoyed i think we're in a loop now that's why it's showing showing uh this guy again and again but yeah anyway hope you guys enjoyed a lot and i'll see you later take care guys